You better make a soundtrack album for this that's just all werewolf pun music. There's going to be a lot of them. Yeah. Anyway, they're nothing but mammals. In 2017... Universal Studios announced the birth of a new shared universe of monster movies, bringing their classic horror icons into the contemporary franchise film landscape. But after the critical and financial failure of its first installment, the project was indefinitely abandoned. Now, in 2022, the powers that be have called upon one pulp horror devotee and one snarky film critic to unearth the concept. I'm Dylan Roth. And I'm Dalton DeShane. Are you afraid of the dark universe? Hello, everyone, and welcome to Are You Afraid of the Dark Universe? I am your co-host, Dylan Roth. And I am co-host number two, Dalton DeShane. And it is, once again, the year 2023. Uh, the intro still says 2022. Well, the, the intro says that in 2022, well, it says universe... now in 2022. Oh, okay, then it is That's the problem. Up. Okay, we'll fix it. I think by the time we fix it, it'll probably be 2024. Uh, yeah, you know, it's the <laughs> writing the wrong date on the checks kind of thing. Uh-huh. Uh, hello, welcome to the podcast. If this is your first time listening, because uh, we've got a lot of new listeners recently, well, thank you yeah, and thanks, welcome. Everybody. Welcome to phase two of Are You Afraid of the Dark Universe? Uh, what this podcast is, uh, if you're not familiar, uh, is we try to fix the dark universe. The dark universe was a failed attempt by Universal Studios to create their own Marvel Cinematic Universe, but using movie monsters instead of superheroes. Uh, it quietly fizzled out after uh, the release of 2017's The Mummy with Tom Cruise, which was a huge flop. But we have picked up the pieces, and every episode we pitch a new movie in the series. We are now into phase two. Our last movie was The Mummy Returns, a sequel to that Tom Cruise flop. And now we have our first sequel to a movie that we invented. More specifically, Dylan has a sequel to a movie that Dylan invented. Yeah, I'm. Uh, it's exciting that I'm. This is uh, today's episode uh, for new listeners. It's fairly uh, accessible if you haven't listened to any of other stuff. But it is a sequel to our remake of The Wolfman, and also follows up on the developments with those characters from our Avengers style crossover, The Dark Legion House of Dracula. So if you are the kind of person who is not such a completist that they're going to go back and listen to the show in order, but does want to have all the threads from this episode, including whatever, we're going we're gonna to fill you in, but then those are the ones to check out. Go back and listen to episode three, Will the Wolfman, and our two-parter uh, crossover episode. But let's assume that you know, nobody's got time for that. We're going to be, uh, we'll, we'll get you reacquainted, and we're going to uh, dive into the next chapter in the Dark Universe, which is entitled Werewolves of London. Yes, film two of phase two. I've been very much anticipating this one. I've been anticipating a a lot your first movie of phase two because after our sort of phase one recap episode, I know you had a lot of sort of uh, wishes of things that you preferred to have changed from your initial two movies. This is your first movie since then uh, doing on your own. And also I got a chance to write the werewolves a little bit in Dark Legion. And so I'm just interested to see where their story goes. But how are you feeling about this pitch? I'm feeling really happy with it. I, it's a big one. This is going to be, I mean, you've probably already seen from the runtime, but I'm I'm sure this will probably be, be at least episode. as long as the last, uh, as the mummy returns. I really hope we don't break two hours. We'll see. You all already know. <laughs> but um, so, so with, um, so if you did not listen to these previous episodes, in our version of the Wolfman, I introduced not one, but two lead werewolves. We have a new version of Larry Talbot, the werewolf from The Wolfman, 1941. Originally played by Lon Chaney Jr. And then we also, uh, the love interest character from that movie is the inspiration behind our other werewolf, who's Gwen Conliffe, played by Amber Midthunder. Whereas our Larry Talbot is played by Mason Gooding of the Scream movies, the new Scream movies. Uh, Nepo Baby. Yeah, I keep doing it. I don't think I added <laughs> any more Nepo Babies in this cast. Uh, I, I, I don't. I think. I don't think so. They're mostly British, so maybe They're I just don't hidden, know their famous Nepo parents. Babies. Yeah. yeah. But so in that story, we're introduced to both our sort of rich heir to a mining fortune Wolfman, and then this sort of like very politically active socialist student from his college. They both go to. She's woke. That's right. Yeah. She's got the woke mind virus. (laughs) (laughs) She's afflicted by lycanthropy and the woke mind virus. Well, as we're going to discover, lycanthropy is the woke mind virus in our show. Oh, interesting. And it's good. (laughs) Um, Yes, we support the the, woke mind virus. uh, So, in The Wolfman, basically, uh, it 
These two characters are both turned into werewolves. Their lives are flipped upside down, and they're forced to go on the run after being uh, charged with the manslaughter of a third werewolf. Larry Talbot is a sheltered rich kid who has had to leave, like, the nest and, like, this beautiful, like, life of luxury that where he was going to become, like, a CEO just by birth, you know? So it really sucks for him to become a werewolf. Obviously, it doesn't generally rock to become a werewolf, but Gwen, he was kind of coming from from very little. She found it kind of empowering to to have this literal superpower now, mm -hmm. and even though it has the major drawback of like becoming a mindless beast three nights out of the month, uh, the rest of the time she's strong. She has this new community. Uh, and like a cause, and she's connected to this larger world. Yeah, we should say our werewolves do have some powers when they're not werewolves, like enhanced senses, right? Yeah, and that's and, consistent and with most yeah. of your 20th century post-Kurt um wolf werewolf lore, your American werewolf in London and sure. so on. So they're basically, for better or worse, I've basically made a, a, them into like superhero movies, and that pattern is kind of going to continue here. I would call Werewolves of London a, like, a light adventure film. Okay. I would say it's no more of a horror movie than a my last light one was. adventure in the dark universe. Okay. An adventure film. <laughs> uh, I would say it's mostly kind of, uh, I would, I would say this is like, maybe this is kind of like closest to like our Ant-Man, Ant-Man one, like in terms of where it sits in our universe. I thought the invisible man was our Ant-Man. Fuck. We have two of those. <laughs> uh, I mean, we know that of the two of us, I'm the one who's less of a horror writer, uh, and in this case, I thought I wanted to go darker. And as I was writing it, for the most part, it, it has its dark moments. It has its dramatic moments. Uh, obviously, we're dealing with characters who have had a lot happen in their lives. Uh, in the Dark Legion House of Dracula, the two werewolves join with all of our other monsters and uh, fight Dracula and Dracula's forces. But among Dracula's forces are Larry's mom, Rita Talbot, who was mm -hmm. turned into a vampire as a result of Larry's whole misadventure. And that movie ends with Larry basically wimps out on saving Gwen, there were a couple at this point, from being murdered by his mother. And she has to be rescued by Victor Frankenstein, our weird creature, instead. So they break up at the end of House of Dracula. Larry is mourning his mother and this relationship. And now he's been, well, we're going to find out where he's been. Yeah, it was we we ended them. I mean, I think probably our strongest character beat in Dark Legion was with these two werewolves where Larry had to make the choice of either saving his girlfriend by murdering his mother or killing his girlfriend <laughs> by not murdering his mother. And in the end, he he made his choice, which was to not kill his mom. And luckily, Gwen was saved by Frank Frankenstein killing his mom instead. So now his mom's dead. And Gwen is kind of like, why the fuck didn't you save me? Yeah, it's a really awful situation. You can kind of understand where both of them are coming from. Yes. Right. But it's it's a good conflict to launch our next story. And so going into Werewolves of London, which is uh, inspired in part by a universal horror movie that predates the Wolfman called Werewolf of London. It's under the Universal Horror Classics label. Like, they added it onto Peacock in October and then took it down with the rest of the stuff. But they, uh, it has kind of different rules and it introduces a couple of ideas that I was surprised found, like, I, I found kind of inspiring for what our next werewolf movie was going to be. Uh, it's also, like Warren those... Zevon fucking rules, and that's where he got the name <laughs> of the song from. So, uh, so I, I borrowed a little bit of from that. Uh, just like with The Wolfman, I kind of took, like, the opening beats from the classic movie as my launch pad and then went off in a different direction. And I also feel like uh, because of an American werewolf in London, we just kind of have an association with werewolves in England. Sure. Uh, Although I learned something really funny today. Uh, I was uh, running this script by my friend and official Are You Afraid of the Dark Universe uh, British accuracy and sensitivity reader, <laughs> uh, Rhi Oliva. And she told me that there are no longer any wolves uh, in the UK. They're extinct. They killed all the wolves and all the bears. And so now the only remaining apex predators are birds. And maybe some werewolves. And maybe some werewolves. So I, thankfully, I didn't rely on any wild wolves existing in my script. because That then, is good. Yeah. Uh, I mean, but we could also, you know, it's fiction. We could It's fiction. Wolves. We can do whatever we want. Like, but apparently, uh, my script has passed the test as reads is actually being taken place in London. The slang is right. A couple of... The slang was mostly right to begin with, and now a couple of tweaks have been made with the help of Re, and now it's Great. a little bit more accurate. I did not take any of the suggestions that made the script incomprehensible to me as an American. <laughs> uh, so, all right. So, but my, my character objective here is basically... I talked about this a little bit on the episode where we went back and looked at phase one. 
Gwen and Larry started out in The Wolfman as sort of two sides of, like, my political development, like, of being kind of a, a naive, like, obviously not rich like he's rich, but like a naive rich kid, relatively speaking, and somebody who's been on the other side of it and is now like a, a leftist and kind of obnoxious about it. Uh, but then when we did House of Dracula, just by the nature of having only X amount of time for each character and having very specific things we need each of them to do, I feel like we ended up making Larry into kind of a big baby. And this movie, my main goal was to develop Larry as a character and figure out more of what his deal is independent from other characters right which is uh it's a tall order especially because i feel like gwen is probably a fan favorite at this point Mm -hmm. which i i would say we didn't really do this for the mummy returns but i want to offer my perspective as a fan of the wolfman series because i don't know if you're this is your first time listening i don't know anything about this pitch i have not looked at any of dylan's pitch i don't know who's in it i don't know what the plot is so as someone who is just a fan of these characters the things that i would want from a wolfman sequel We've talked about how in the first one, Gwen never turns, mm-hmm. which we did fix in Dark Legion. Yes. But I would I would probably want go into this wanting a little bit more equanimity in the werewolfing. Right. Um, I definitely want to see the fallout of their relationship, and I want to see where they go from here. I feel like we've turned them into a big, like, they're kind of the core couple. Um, I mean, they're kind of the flip side of Jenny and right. Carol, well, you who have are your, now happily together. You have, like, your sort of, like, uh, your your will-they-won't-they they couple, and then you have your stable couple. Yes, and so they're kind of our, our will-they-won't-they-get-back-together, will-they-make-up, will-they-forgive-each-other, or are they going to keep hating each other? I definitely want to see uh, bigger action, right? Uh-huh. I feel like with the sequels, you always want to escalate, you know, with the action. The, in the last one, our big werewolf set piece was at the gym mm-hmm. uh, with Larry as a werewolf. Probably in this one, I would want to see multiple werewolves getting into some shit in London, you know? Uh, And uh, yeah, those would be, I think, some of my big hopes going in. But okay. I mean, I think I can satisfy some of this stuff for sure. Hopefully, I mean, we'll check back in. It's fan expectations. I like this as an addition to our format now that we are revisiting things and like we we do like dig each other's work and that's we are exposed to it in this way where uh, we're like involved in this larger creative project together, but individually the movies are a surprise to each of us and we mm-hmm. get to experience them as a listener. So I think that's a really interesting uh, thing to to uh, talk about going forward as we do these sequels. And then you can give me the feedback later about whether or not you got what you wanted or got what you didn't know you wanted or, you know, just, just fucking didn't like it. Well, that's the thing <laughs> about fan expectations is you might not give me what I want, but... I feel like the job of us as storytellers is you don't want to give the fans exactly what they want because then everyone will know what to expect and it'll be boring. That's a dead sentence to me. That's like why so much franchise stuff sucks. But the thing you have to keep in mind as a storyteller is that if you deny the fans what they want, you have to give them something better in return. Um, Something they didn't know they wanted that is going to leave them more satisfied than what they expected. Um, And obviously I hope that I've done this here. Of course. But it's, 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 you know, it's difficult. I saw uh, Magic Mike's Last Dance this past weekend Uh and it was not, I think, the movie that people expected and sometimes that's good. Like, you and I both like Halloween ends, right? Mm -hmm. It's not what, it's not what anybody wanted but it's good. But, but on the flip side of it, Magic Mike's Last Dance is not as good of a drama as Magic Mike, nor is it a bombastic fun like Magic Mike XXL. Mm. So uh, hopefully I've made a uh, somewhere closer to a Halloween ends than a Magic Mike's <laughs> Last Dance. <laughs> well, since it's the dark universe, I would also hope you made closer to a Halloween ends than Magic Mike's Last Dance. Not that Ma- there's anything wrong with Magic Mike's Last Dance, but I think but there on, aren't the, any werewolves. on the dark universe spectrum, we're probably sure. closer to... Halloween ends, which brings me to, I do want to, before we get started, I was going to say this for the end, but since we were talking about it, I am issuing you a challenge, Dylan Roth. Oh? I want to see you in this podcast write a straight ahead horror film. Okay. Because we have, we've been talking about that. We, the, the cold conceit from episode one was like, you said in episode one, I'm not a horror guy. I'm more, I'm into every other genre except horror, but since then, we have watched some horror movies we you have. really liked. And I've been watching more and more horror movies as a matter of course. Like, I've been trying to go to see them in theaters because that's where mm-hmm. I enjoy them more. I've been trying to fill gaps in my viewing. You uh, loved Exorcist 3? I loved Exorcist 3. And I and pretty much everything you recommend for me, like, uh, we talked about this in the last episode, I really loved His House. His House is fantastic. fantastic we saw Megan together, and you really yes. liked Megan. And we have to make sure to see Scream 6 when it's in theaters in a yes. couple weeks. Go, because we saw Scream, uh, we saw five, Scream together, 5 together, and we loved yeah. it. And so it is really it. I 
I accept your challenge. I can't promise it'll be in phase two. Even with Dracula Lives? Dracula, well, do you consider Blade to be a horror movie? I think it's I think it's closer. We got to get you on the right direction. I know it's intimidating because it's a probably it's beats and it's tropes are maybe less comfortable for you when you're writing. But I think we got to break you out of that wheelhouse. And I want to see I just want to maybe Dracula lives won't totally satisfying it. But I think it's a step in the right direction. But it will by, be it will be nothing like this. By the time we finish phase three, I want just a straight ahead horror film from Dylan Roth. OK, I'm going to I'm going to rise to that challenge. I'm going to do my very best to do that. Uh, And also, I think that's important because I don't want you to feel like you have to make all the horror movies and that you don't get to stretch out as much. Like, so far, I think you've gotten to, obviously, The Invisible Man, big swing in the opposite direction, and still, to my reckoning, our our best episode. (laughs) But it's, all right, I'll get off of it. I will. I will accept your challenge. Challenge Dracula is issued. Lives, the maybe. gauntlet is thrown. And I'm obviously I don't want to say anything about the Phantom. I have my own thing happening with that. But I wanted to get that out of the way up top so I we appreciate can relax it. and the, let this the, be the yes. light adventure. The readers have heard. Sorry, the listeners have have heard this challenge. Mm-hmm. The gauntlet's been laid down. I can't disappoint. Exactly. And if you fail, <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm making this up as we go. If you fail. Uh, I get to schedule a uh, 12-hour horror marathon that you have to watch. Dalton, I want to do that anyway. In one sitting. That sounds like fun. You don't think I want to sit down and watch 12 hours of movies? I have a That's kid fair. now. That sounds like a great day. All right. <laughs> Maybe we'll just do that anyway. Okay. All right. Okay. What so, else do we need to set up for The Werewolves of London before we roll picture? The director I have set up for this project, I have selected Helena Rain, who directed Bodies, 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 which is also oh, nice. not exactly a horror movie, but horror adjacent. And the other reason that I picked her is because these are both movies about a messy friend group uh, mm. and in my age range. So uh, I did I th- like Bodies, Bodies, Bodies. Yeah, we saw that together too. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I think that um, it's the right, I feel like that's the right vibe. Uh, She's not British. She's European. Okay. Uh, I could not think of a British director that would be the right fit unless I went full Guy Ritchie. Yes, there's some Guy Ritchie in this. I, I DNA. Feel, I feel with uh, with the Brits, you don't necessarily have to get like the, uh, you know, it's not as important for British people to tell British stories. No, I know. But there's a, okay, the movie has, and this is going to be very clear at a certain point when we have some, some really fast pitter-patter, has a confirmed British rhythm to it. Okay. Uh, especially when it's like in the comedic sections. And I'll stop talking now and we'll just go into it. Um, okay. All right. Submitted for the approval of uh, Universal Pictures Board of Directors, I give you Dylan Roth's Werewolves of London. From Belang Mountain in Sichuan, China, you can look down and see an opaque blanket of fluffy white clouds. Tourists call it the Cloud Ocean. Dr. Yo Ming An, played by Hoon Lee of Warrior and Banshee, A man with a neat beard and warm climbing attire peers out over the horizon and takes in the view. It's evening, and the cloud ocean has taken on a warm, gossamer glow. He'd like to take a seat right here and watch the sunset, but he's got work to do. He wanders away from the cliff face towards a greener side of the mountain. Dr. Yo kneels down to investigate a crop of flowers growing in a misty valley, essentially a lake just off the cloud ocean. From this pool of moist air, he plucks a small blue flower whose petals fold upward like a tulip. He retrieves a scientific sample kit from his pack and carefully picks one of the flower's petals. He loads a piece of the petal onto a slide and studies it with a small handheld travel microscope. Apparently pleased with what he sees, he packs the rest of the flower into a sterile bag. It's later, close to sundown, and Dr. Yo has made camp. By a low campfire, he loads one of the flower petals into a small device, which heats it and grinds it into a powder before combining it with a fluid. He draws the solution into a syringe, sits back on a folding camping chair, and stares at it for a while. He looks out west, where the sun has disappeared behind the mountain range, but not yet totally set below the amber sky. Above him, a full moon hangs, ready to claim its dominance over the night. How's it looking? Dr. Yo is startled by a voice from behind him. He turns around to see Chip Lester, once again played by Patrick Fabian, a tall white man with short blonde hair wearing a crisp black three-piece suit in 11-degree weather. Yo catches his breath. As strange a sight as Chip is, he has been expecting him. You caught up with me awfully fast. The sun's still up. I couldn't resist. Besides, I'm hoping the news you've got for me is worth the risk. It's promising, but inconclusive. There's still only one way to know for sure if it'll have the effect we're looking for, and, well... What's the worst that could happen? More to the point. Could it be any worse than what's going to happen if you don't take it? This is a big mountain. 
I'd be surprised if there's another soul within 10 kilometers. I'll try not to take that personally. Dr. Yo laughs, then sighs. It's not actually very funny when he thinks about it. If I told you this was going to save lives, would you believe me? Not for a second. Smart man. The sun's almost done setting. No longer washed out by the sun's refraction, the moon's relative glow intensifies. The moonlight reaches the liquid in Dr. Yo's syringe, and it begins to glow too. He lifts it to his eye and marvels at what could be a very good sign. Then his breath quickens, and he's suddenly sweating. His teeth clench, then his muscles. It's happening. It's time, Dr. Yo. Dr. Yo fights his seizing body, and as carefully as he can, pokes the needle into a vein in his left arm. His thumb's on the plunger, but he's paralyzed with fear. Do it! Yo squeezes his eyes tight. Now! Chip breaks into a sprint towards Yo, unnaturally fast. That same moment, Yo takes a sharp breath and injects the silver fluid into his arm. His pupils contract, and suddenly, we smash cut to titles. Werewolves of London. Act one. Just as a recap, to make sure I got the uh, the action right here. So he was, seems like he was turning into a werewolf with the f- full moon and then in- ejected himself, injected himself. That is what it looks like. That is what it looks like. It appear- that's what it appears to the viewer. It seems that he was transforming of some kind in the full moon and then injected something as Yes, in fact, it's exactly. Okay. Great. Okay, act one, years later. It's a rainy night in London. But of course, what other kind of night is there? The locals are all prepared with their max and umbrellas as the rain pours over the working-class Brixton district of South London. One figure, however, is woefully unprepared for the downpour, sopping wet in a gray-hooded sweatshirt, gym shorts, and a backpack stuffed so full that the zippers bulge open, guaranteeing that its contents will need some drying off. We follow this figure down a few blocks. A couple walks by him on the sidewalk and keeps their distance, as if they can smell him from five feet away. We still don't see his face, but from his body language, this doesn't seem to faze him. He's used to it. As he turns the next corner, we get a look at the half-faded lettering on his sweatshirt. Via Lobos Gym, Talbot, California, established 1996. Inside a cozy lower middle class flat, a man in his 50s sits in a worn out easy chair, drinking a beer and watching football. Our focus shifts to a photo sitting on the end table of our man, Nigel Jumbe, played by David Harwood of Homeland and Supergirl, a few years younger with his arm around the shoulder of his sister, Rita, the likeness of Tandaway Newton. The doorbell rings. Nigel takes a look at his phone and sees that it's after 9 p.m. When whoever's out there starts pounding on the door, Nigel heaves himself out of his chair and answers it with the chain bolt locked. Outside in the rain is a ragged young man in a filthy gray hoodie. His hair and beard are unkempt, and he doesn't smell very good. Nigel starts closing the door almost as a reflex. Sorry, mate. Can't help you. Uncle Nigel? Nigel shuts the door, turns as if to return to his television, then processes what he's just heard. He reopens the door and studies the stranger. He can hardly believe it. Larry? In Nigel's kitchen, Larry Talbot, played by Mason Gooding, holds a steaming cup of tea close to his face. He's sitting at the small kitchen table wearing one bath towel over his head and another over his shoulders. Nigel stands facing him, leaning back against the sink. For a while, neither man speaks. After a sip, Larry breaks the silence. Thank you. You had us all worried sick about you. Larry says nothing and keeps his eyes on his tea. Your mother. God, I don't even know if you know. Yeah. I was... Larry stops himself. I heard. Your father was desperate to find you for the funeral. Thought for sure you'd turn up. When you didn't, he up and wrote you off for dead. Larry is again silent. Nigel's grip on the counter behind him tightens. So where you been then? Romania, then Hungary. Followed the Alps west for a while. Crossed the English Channel about a week ago. And at no point during your impromptu gap year did you feel the need to tell anyone where you were, that you were even alive... It's complicated. Like hell it is. You vanished, and my sister died while traveling the world searching for you. Between her closed casket and your utter fucking absence, the rest of us were left to mourn the two of you in a soul-sucking vacuum. Larry bows his head over his tea. After a moment, Nigel lowers himself to one knee in front of his nephew. He leans down to place his own tearful eyes into Larry's sight. You're the only family I've got left, Larry. Larry finally looks Nigel in the eye, and the dam breaks. He cries, and Nigel embraces him. Larry falls forward, and the two men sob together on the kitchen floor. Larry turns on the shower and lets the scalding hot water burn away days' worth of dirt, dead skin, and bad vibes. Afterwards, he takes some clippers and shaves his beard. Nigel lets a change of clothes for him in the toilet seat. By the sink, his phone has finally recharged. He opens it up and checks the weather app. It's a waxing gibbous moon tonight, with two nights to go before it's full. Downstairs, Nigel's cooking up some eggs for dinner, or breakfast, or whatever you eat at 1 a.m. when sleep is not on the agenda. Larry walks down the hall and scans the array of family photos. 
He and his parents are in a lot of them. Larry stops to examine one in particular, a candid shot of Larry, his parents Rita and John, played by Jared Harris, and Uncle Nigel on a chartered fishing boat. It's the least glamorous image we've ever seen of the Talbots. They almost look like a normal family. Larry joins Nigel in the kitchen and takes a seat at the table. Nigel puts another hot cup of tea and a plate in front of Larry and sits down across from him. His own side of the table is bare. Larry eagerly digs into his eggs. When was the last time you had a hot meal? Wednesday. I was at a hostel in Ashford. It took you that long to get here from Ashford? I did a lot of it on foot. Turns out hitchhiking isn't really a thing anymore. I suppose it slipped your mind that you're filthy, stinking rich. Larry shakes his head. I can't touch that money. Dad would be on my ass in a second. (laughs) She came from Greece. She had a thirst for knowledge. What? Never mind. Kids. American kids. Your mother never told me what happened between you two. I know you were wanted for manslaughter and that. For some unfathomable reason, you jumped bail with that Indian tart. Gwen. And don't call her a tart. I know what that means. Also, she's Pueblo. And where is this Gwen Pueblo now? Larry has finished his eggs. He lets his fork clank down on his empty plate. Beats me. Last I saw her, she was headed back to the U.S. with a nerdy lesbian couple. Not sure how they were planning on sneaking her into the country, though, seeing as she's also got an outstanding warrant. Imagine you're landing at JFK, and the next thing you know, the state of California sent some bleach blonde Raylan Givens after you. You're dodging me. Don't think I don't see that. Rita used to do it all the time. She used to take these long detours to keep me from learning anything real about her life. Now she's gone, there's a million things I'll never know about her. So... Are you going to enlighten me, or am I going to go to my graves to wonder what my sister was doing on a doomed chartered flight from Transylvania? You don't want to know. Don't tell me what I want. There's a stare down. Nigel tries to pierce through Larry's eyes, but his shields are up. The soft, pampered rich boy is long gone. These eyes have seen some shit. Nigel gets up from the table and slowly walks from the kitchen to his bedroom down the hall, closing the door firmly behind him. Larry breathes a sigh of relief and sinks back in his chair. The next morning, Nigel goes off to work and sends Larry to buy groceries. Cuts a Larry at the supermarket, dropping a six-pack of a small-batch IPA into a shopping basket. As he wanders the aisles, he walks past a shop clerk, restocking the shelves on a ladder. Her back is to him, but she registers his presence sharply, like she's just heard a bell ring. Larry, having passed her, stops walking, though he's confused as to why. He sniffs at the air and, puzzled, continues shopping. Larry's in the checkout queue, and he hits a snag. He's got no form of ID to prove he's of age to buy alcohol. And despite the legal age being only 18 here in the UK, his boyish good looks are working against him. The checkout clerk is giving him a hard time, until he's called away by the shop clerk from earlier. Well, I've got this one, Tommy. This is Shopa, played by Anya Chalatra, who plays Yennefer in The Witcher. Shopa is a woman in her mid-twenties wearing some heavy eyeshadow and some really good piercings. Larry can sense that there's something about her, something that tickles the part of his brain that only wakes up under a full moon. Without experiences or context, this is a feeling that's easily confused with horny, and the two are not mutually exclusive. Chopa smiles and rings up Larry's beers. Thanks. Don't mention it. Do I? Do you ever get the feeling like you've met someone before, but you know that's impossible? Every now and again. Do you think it means anything? Chopa pulls a pen and a scrap of paper from her register and scribbles her number on it. I'll tell you later. She extends her hand to him with a paper inside. He reaches for it, and she shakes his hand. The touch is electric for both of them. I'm Chopa. Larry. She releases his hand and leaves the paper inside. He tries to play it cool on his way out, but he can't help it. He looks back and smiles goofy as he crosses the exit. She can't fully maintain either, laughing and blushing just before he turns away. That evening, Larry and Chopa take a stroll through the Brixton streets. So, do you make a habit of texting strange women who meet you at a supermarket? Whoa, slut-shaming me right off the bat. That sounds like a yes to me. Of the occasions when a strange woman has slipped me her number at the supermarket, I have texted her 100% of the time. And what about you? Is this your MO? Because I gotta tell you, if our positions were reversed, I don't think that would fly. It's what I do when I meet someone like me. Larry stops walking. Like you? You don't have to hide it from me. I've been moonlighting for years, and my senses are keener than most. Moonlighting? Is that what you call it here? It's what I call it. Catch you though, innit? I don't think we should talk about this here. Chopa takes a step towards Larry, and he takes a step back towards the storefront. She fiddles with the drawstring on his hoodie. Would you rather talk about it in private? Anybody ever tell you that you're a very aggressive person? As if to answer in the affirmative, she starts running her hands over his chest. We're not like other people, Larry. We burn hotter. We die younger. And we feel more, especially with each other. Oh, I know. Believe me. I'm just an old-fashioned guy. I can smell lies, too. I can teach you how if you want. 
Larry lays his hands on Shopa's shoulders and gently pushes her to arm's length. He cradles the bridge of his nose. Just, uh, fuck. Uh, just give me a second to think. Shopa smirks. His hesitation has only bolstered her interest. Larry sees this in her eyes and tightens up even more. I, I gotta go. Larry starts walking away but stops short and winces when he hears Shopa say, I know who you are! He lets out a sigh of resignation. Then he starts running. Shopa grunts to herself and takes off after him. Now we get a chase on foot through the streets of Brixton at twilight, one in which both Predator and Prey are supernaturally fast and nimble. Larry weaves between oncoming pedestrians and darts across streets, hurtling the hoods of moving cars with the grace of a parkour master. When Larry looks back and sees that Shopa is keeping pace, he tries going vertical, running up and along walls onto rooftops and leaping from building to building. Shopa is not only following, but gaining, and that's not all. While he runs, Larry sees that another figure is sprinting parallel to him on a building across the street. Shopa is not alone. We pull back and see that there are not two, but five figures running across the rooftops of Brixton, all converging on Larry with startling speed. One leaps across a gap and spear tackles Larry off his feet. Larry rolls and recovers, and the battle is joined. His first foe is Jer, played by Franz Drama of The Flash and Attack the Block, who may be the fastest of the pack, but he's a scrub of a fighter. Larry is able to evade his wild swings easily and knock him back into an air conditioning intake box. He's going to need a minute. Next is Shopa herself, who squares off against Larry and offers him the first punch. He spreads his arms as if to say, Really? Then she lands a solid cross to Larry's jaw. Larry wipes the blood from his mouth, shrugs, and then scoops her up and power bombs her onto the roof hard enough to bounce nearby pebbles and detritus. By now, there's been enough time for the whole gang, three more unmorphed lycanthropes, to catch up with Larry and surround him on the rooftop. They're all about to jump him at once when one of them, Drake, played by English martial artist and stunt legend Scott Atkins, a very English-looking middle-aged white man, waves them off. He steps up to Larry, who has a solid three inches of height on him. What? You want next, Gramps? Faster than Larry can even think, Drake unloads a flurry of expert strikes from the entire atlas of martial arts, and Larry collapses like his strings have been cut. Larry wakes up groggily to find that he's bound to a concrete pillar in a dank, musty warehouse. He's bloody and bruised, seated on the cold floor, and his five werewolf adversaries are milling around above him. One of them, a pale, preppy-looking 20-something named Casper, played by Sean Delaney of Killing Eve, takes notice that Larry's regained consciousness. Hey, guys, he's waking up. Soon, the moonlight from the warehouse windows is blocked out as the whole gang looms over him. Casper, Shopa, Jer, Drake, and a fifth member, Rosie, played by Charlie XCX, <laughs> who is chewing gum very loudly. Good morning, sunshine, says Shopa. Jer chimes in to badger her. Come on, this is your only Brit. You have to do this one voice. It's 11.30 at night. Come off it. It's an expression. Where am I? You're in the secret headquarters of the Brixton Bloodhounds. That's our gang. A werewolf gang. Shut it, Jer! What do you want with me? Well, that depends. Are you the Larry Talbot who laid siege to Castle Dracula back in November? I'm not telling you anything while I'm chained to a pillar. Also, how do you even know about Castle Dracula? Please, the King of Vampires was dethroned overnight and his entire armory turned to dust. Between intelligence leaks from Prodigium and the hundreds of now unemployed vampire familiars trading their secrets for amnesty, there are a lot of stories going around. Is it true you have a friend who can raise the dead? For the first time, Rosie speaks. And the Invisible Man. What's that about? Leave it, all of you. My point is, you're probably one of the two most famous werewolves in the world right now. And we could really use your help. My help? Are you shitting me? I told you we should have just asked him. I was about to and he ran off on me. After you started groping me in the street, which is even creepier now that I know you weren't even trying to have sex with me. Oh, I was definitely trying to have sex with you. And after that, I was going to ask you if you wanted to join my werewolf gang. Don't really make sense to do it the other way around. Can't be bringing another lousy lay into the Brixton bloodhounds. Remember Susan? The rest of the gang all groans and murmurs in recognition. The point is, we've got our hands on a sexy bit of intel with ramifications for all wolf kind. We think it's actionable, but we've got a limited window and frankly... None of us has seen much real action, except for Drake, and he refuses to teach us anything. When you've traveled halfway around the world, twice, and trained with seven of the greatest senseis in all of martial arts, then maybe you'll be worthy of my training. Halfway around the world, twice, is just the whole way around the world once, innit? Not if you take the same route back as you took getting there. Oh my god, shut up! Everyone takes a breath, and Shopa collects herself. <clears throat> Have you ever heard of a serum that can induce a werewolf episode when it's not a full moon, even in daylight? Yes. Unfortunately, I have. Then it's true. You have been dosed with it. Twice. It sucked ass. Well, 
What if I told you that it was made by a scientist who Dracula kept under lock and key for a better part of a decade? And that said scientist is on his way to London as we speak, and we know exactly when and where he'll be arriving. And what do you plan to do? Kill him? Preferably not. Depends on how cooperative he is. But if anyone is going to control this deadly werewolf weapon, don't you think it ought to be werewolves and nobody else? I suppose. So, will you help us? No. Jer is indignant now. Why not? Because you beat me up and tied me to a wall. Oh, give over, mate. Be a sport. Fuck you. Told you. Fine, go off. You've earned it. I told you we wanted the other one. Excuse me? I said from the very beginning that this was a DOS. It was either we find Gwen Conliffe or nobody. Hang on. What the hell does that mean? <sighs> to be honest, Larry, in most of the stories, Gwen comes off like the brains of the operation and you sound like, well, a bit of a pleb. What? You know, a wanker. I, no, I know what it means. What do, you, what do you mean? We heard that you spent most of the Dracula thing whining and crying for your mum while Gwen was beating a huge undead fucker into submission with his own arm. Is any of that true, Larry? No. Yes, sort of. Look, I contributed a lot to that mission, okay? And any crying I may or may not have done for my mother was completely justified. Do any of the stories mention me ripping an invisible vampire in half with my bare hands? Huh? Or that my mother was one of the vampires who was trying to kill us? Or that she died that night right in front of me? For a moment, the Brixton Bloodhounds actually shut up. Maybe I'm not as smart or as tough as Gwen. I'm not trying to take anything away from her. But I've survived every fucked up monster mash that she has. So Gwen can call herself whatever she wants, but I am still the goddamn wolf man. Does that mean you're in then? Yes, I'm in. Fucking untie me. Uncle Nigel is dozing through Netflix in his easy chair. He stirs as Larry lets himself in. He swivels around to see his nephew enter. Larry is still a mess from his fight with the bloodhounds, but he manages to flop onto the couch before Nigel can get a good look at him. How was your date? Great. I'm seeing her again tomorrow night. Nice girl then. Nope. Nigel chuckles to himself and heads off to bed. It's the following evening at the Brixton Bloodhound's secret headquarters, which, again, is just an abandoned warehouse where they've set up a gas-powered generator, a laptop, and a projector perched on a rolling library cart, a punching bag, a few mismatched chairs, and five or six bare-stained mattresses. It does not smell great. Drake is hitting the bag, Shopa is working on the computer, Cher and Rosie are having a snog in the corner. Meanwhile, Casper gives Larry the penny tour. We all have jobs and gaffes of our own. This is just sort of a clubhouse. We used to decorate it better, but then we just wreck everything each time we locked ourselves in for the full moon. Oh, so that's what the mattresses are for. Well, that and Tumble Tuesdays. As Casper turns his back, Larry cringes and mouths Tumble Tuesdays silently to himself. The gang eventually assembles around a couple of mismatched chairs facing the wall, onto which the laptop screen is being projected. Chopa stands in front of the projection. All right, everyone, time to call the meeting to order. Recording secretary, please take roll. Larry can barely contain himself as a group of five people who are all sitting right next to each other take attendance. <laughs> next comes a two-minute debate to resolve Rosie and Drake having both volunteered to make scones for their next potluck. If you want to hear or read this scene, hit us up at Dark Universe Pod on Twitter, because I did, in fact, write the whole thing. <laughs> Classic. Of course you did. <laughs> next to order of business, the capture or assassination of Dr. Yeo Ming An. Uh, we have a special guest for this briefing. He is the formal risk manager of the Talbot University chapter of the Delta Chi fraternity and a member of Nick Morton's anti-Dracula brigade. Please give a warm welcome to Mr. Larry Talbot. Chopin steps aside and Casper offers enthusiastic applause as Larry awkwardly rises from his chair and steps up to the laptop. He opens up a Google Drive folder and finds a photo of Dr. Yo, the same scientist who we saw on the mountaintop earlier. Uh, yeah. So... According to intel Shilpa got from her friend who works at... Larry checks his notes. The Nandos on Denmark Hill, whose cousin works at MI5, this guy here is Dr. Yo Ming An. He's a biochemist who's been off the radar for most of the past decade. Before he disappeared, Dr. Yo published a bunch of papers about a rare plant called Meraphasa lupina lumina. According to his research, Meraphasia is a luna synthetic, meaning it draws energy from moonlight rather than sunlight. Casper raises his hand. Casper, there's only six of us here. You don't have to raise your fucking hand. Casper looks to Shopa for permission, and Shopa nods approval. How is it possible for something to be luna synthetic? As far as science is concerned, it's not. Moonlight is just sunlight that bounces off the lunar surface, there's, so there's nothing special about it. Except... Jer interrupts. Except it turns us into big, gnarly wolves. Exactly. This is why Shilpa's friends are convinced that this doctor and his research are related to the werewolf-inducing serum that Dracula's goons have used to mess with us over the past few years. Dr. Yo resurfaced six months ago, shortly after my friends and I fucked up Castle Dracula. 
So now that Dracula has been depowered and his vampire forces are dust, Yo is apparently back in the world and is going to be coming through London tomorrow night. This is our window to nab him before someone else does. From here, we continue Larry's briefing in voiceover while we watch the plan being executed Mission Impossible style. We follow Rosie in line at airport security in a very conspicuous Carmen Sandiego style disguise. We bought Rosie a one-way ticket to Dublin, which will get her past security and into the airport. Do I have a window seat or am I stuck in the aisle? You're not getting on the plane, Rosie. You're just going to get into the airport so you can ID Dr. Yo when he gets off the plane and follow him to the baggage claim. We see Rosie sitting at the gate's waiting area, chewing her gum, peering over the frames of her dark sunglasses as passengers file into the terminal. Dr. Yo comes up the ramp at a brisk pace. There's a young woman on his arm, but we don't get a good look at her. Our attention is on Yo, who's visibly nervous. As he passes, Rosie gets up and follows him. Larry's voiceover continues. Keep tabs on Yo until he's got his bags and is ready to leave. Once he's ready to go, signal the team so that we can get our car into position at the pickup area. We may need you to stall him for a few minutes while we get there. At the baggage claim, Rosie accidentally bumps into Dr. Yo and spills the contents of her comically large handbag all over the floor. Dr. Yo kneels down to help her collect her things while Rosie pr- apologizes profusely. Our point of view follows the two of them down to waist height. Dr. Yo's companion does not crouch down with us, and we only see her distressed jeans and skate sneakers. Oh, I'm so sorry. This is so embarrassing. Oh, it's okay. Let me help. From above, Yo's companion speaks. We need to keep moving. Just a moment while I help this young lady pick up her... Yo notices that the floor in front of him is covered in unopened packs of juicy fruit. He looks up at Rosie's face and she flashes him a cheeky smile. Yo's companion pulls him up by his jacket and the two of them hustle to the exit. As she drags him away, Rosie slips her cell phone into the pocket of Dr. Yo's coat. Now, did we verify that they have juicy fruit in the UK? Believe me, I did my research. It's a very popular gum there. I shouldn't have doubted you. (laughs) Outside in the pickup area, the rest of the gang is all crowded into a minivan. Jer is driving. Casper, riding shotgun, watches as a blue dot representing Rosie's phone starts moving down the road. Casper points at a cab that's just pulled away from the curb. That one. The bloodhounds follow Dr. Yo's cab onto the M25 motorway, headed north to Cambridge. It's a long drive, and the sun is setting. Since they're on a long highway, they give the cab a long following distance in the hopes of evading notice. Larry's voiceover continues. We follow Yo until we get him somewhere secluded, and then we run him off the road. On the tracker, Yo's taxi pulls off the highway into the rural village of Thrift Hill. The bloodhounds see their chance and follow the tracer onto an unpaved road between two farms. Casper checks his phone again and is startled. Wait a minute. They've stopped. Jer looks ahead at the long country road and sees no one, even as the van approaches the signal from Rosie's phone. They pull over and fan out to search the area with their phone flashlights. Rosie, the only one without her own light, stands with her back to a tall, lush tree. Behind her, something falls from its branches. She turns around and finds her phone. Its screen is cracked from the full. Shit, where the hell did you come from? As she fiddles with her damaged property, which looks like someone tried to take a bite out of it, she looks up at the tree branches above. They rustle, then abruptly stop rustling. With no further warning, a massive transformed werewolf dives out of the tree and pounces on an unsuspecting Rosie, swiping at her neck and face with its paws and grinding her back into the dirt road. The bloodied Rosie lifts her head to face her assailant who roars mightily in her face. Drake tackles the wolf off Rosie and starts wrestling the beast. Jer and Casper rush to Rosie's side, while Larry and Shopa try and grab hold of the wolf's legs and pin it to the ground. The wolf isn't having that, and shakes all three of its foes off before digging its teeth hard into Drake's shoulder, and tosses him aside and goes after Larry next, but Shopa grabs its tail, drawing its attention. She gets a deep slash across her face for her trouble. Seizing the opportunity and inspired by Shopa's strategy, Larry retrieves his pocket knife from his jacket, the one monogrammed LT from the first movie, takes a hold of the werewolf's tail, and slices it off. The wolf pulls away from Shopa, howls in pain, and starts writhing in the middle of the road. Backlit by the van's headlights, we see the wolf gradually shrink back into human form, the tone of its howls transitioning into the painful screams of a young woman. She passes out, and the gang, including Rosie, who's being supported by Jaron Casper's shoulders, step forward to have a look. Larry, disbelieving, kneels down to have a better view at the young woman's face. Gwen? End of Act One. Hey, nice little twist there. Thanks. This is a great first act. Thank you. I'm really excited about it. Yeah, I mean, I, I like a lot of things about it. First, I, I think you and I both with our phase two ones have started our movies in like unexpected places, which I really like. Um, uh, I started mine in on a cruise ship in Tokyo, Japan, uh-huh. and you take us to China um, with uh, a character we've never seen. Uh, Interacting and, with a character who's dead. <laughs> yeah, and then Chip Lester. So I... I assume that was a flashback, although 
It yes. hasn't been said. Yes. Okay. Um, I, 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 so Unless the, you brought Chip Lester back. No, I wouldn't do that. But I do <laughs> think it's fun to have an immortal character that we can throw into the backgrounds of other characters. Yeah. Um, so what is, uh, so yeah, the, the idea of starting off on the side of a mountain looking for this flower is directly from Werewolf of London. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Well, um, then I, I, and that's I love what the that. flower comes from too. Um, Interesting. And it is a complete outlier in the mythology of werewolves. As I we should think have watched this fucking movie. I mean, honestly, I only watched it because uh, Universal put a bunch of obscure Universal monster titles on Peacock. So that comes from Werewolf of London. The um, the whole idea of there being like this flower. I think there it's on a Tibetan mountain, but I looked through. I was looking for mountains with particular with the particular traits that I wanted. And uh, there's this character, Dr. Yogami, who is played by the guy who played Charlie Chan. So like, anyway, I just, I took only the idea that I wanted. Um, and then from there, it kind of became a very easy way to mash it up into the mythology that we have. Because we have, like, as soon as I watched Werewolf of London and I saw about that flower, I'm like, oh, that's something that can easily be tied into this werewolfing serum that I created in the first one as an excuse to have a climax where one of our characters is a werewolf and the other <laughs> one wasn't. And I'm, boy, I'm going to do that a lot. <laughs> Uh, no, I think this whole first act, it, it moves really quickly. I was, you know, we we sort of get our quiet beat at the beginning when he meets Nigel, uh, but we very quickly get into the gang, uh, the Bloodhound gang, uh, which... <laughs> Not an accident entirely. <laughs> there, mostly, there better be a fucking Bloodhound gang song in the credits. I would like there to be one at some point. Uh, yeah, I did what not, Bloodhound gang song? I did not pick one. We, I don't okay. know a lot of them. I had a girlfriend in college who really liked the Bloodhound gang, which is funny to me i went through a bloodhound gang phase in college as well but, bad touches is, is is too obvious but maybe that would work during the closing credits but as like a needle drop maybe you'd need something more obscure well here's the thing it's a pretty obvious needle drop that i have to do in the credits of this movie well the credits are long i think i think bad touch would be a good thing to come in at like minute six of the credits sure you know? yeah certainly it's on the soundtrack album which yes. we'll be putting out for every single one of these movies. I promise you. We're oh, gonna... we should do that. We should make mixtapes for the movies. Why aren't Fuck, we doing that? we really that? should do that. We, well, we can start back Patreon that. content. Yes, okay. <laughs> Whenever that happens. Mm -hmm. um, no, but I really like the gang of werewolves. I love... Uh, I Actually, you know, we're talking about this not being a horror movie, but what it most reminds me of, um, it reminds me of the vampire movie Near Dark, uh, which is an 80s vampire movie with uh, Bill Paxton and Lance Hen Henriksen and... Adrian Pazdar in that movie is is basically a vampire version of sort of what's going on here where Adrian Pazdar is sort of like a recent vampire. He's just uh -huh. been turned and he gets brought into like this ragtag gang of uh, experienced vampires that are like roaming. I think I forget what it is. It feels like Nebraska. It's like the something. Midwest, right? Yeah, it's like a, it's like a cornfields yeah. and stuff kind of. Thing. I'm embarrassed that this is another one of my blind spots. Like I really like Catherine Bigelow. Like Strange Days oh, yeah, is one, one of my her, favorite yeah. movies ever. Yeah. Um, and I've never seen that. I know that Near Dark also like Strange Days was not streaming a lot lately, and, uh, for, and then it showed up on Shutter. Showed recently. up on Shutter last year. I did I think, not watch yeah. it while it was there, so I'm eventually going to see it. It's great. Um, and it kind of reminds me. I mean, it also kind of reminded me of The Matrix. Mm -hmm. Uh, I I feel like that was like with like everyone just sort of standing over him and like talking about him in front of him was very Neo. Uh, it's, I mean, I mean, I'll take it. I'll always, I'll always take a Wachowski's comparison. I also say, I don't know any of these actors that you have. I don't know I mean, a single one of them. I just which, picked, <laughs> I, I warned you before the episode that I didn't add any star power to the universe. Which, of this movie, I just have a lot of, I picked a lot of my favorite British actors in my, this age range. Like I'll give you some, some more info about their types, right? Shilpa is played by the actress who plays, uh, Jennifer, like the, in, in the Witcher. So she's got kind of like a, a sort of an intensity to her, but I, I gave her some physical description. Okay. Right? We have the preppy guy, Casper, who plays Kenny, who's like this sort of like sweet boy on Killing Eve who works for MI5. Uh, and and we have uh, Franz Drama is one of the guys from Attack the Block. So he's from the- I have uh, seen Attack the Block. I love yeah. that movie. Um, and uh, Charlie XCX, you know, from music. I do. I do know Charlie. That was the name I knew. Although I have this weird, I have a face blindness with her and who's the other one? I feel like we have so many homies in our circle that are like obsessed with Charlie XCX. Uh -huh. um, and I have seen and this it. crossover with a lot of the same people who are obsessed with Carly Rae Jepsen, even though their music is totally different. Yes. Uh, Carly Rae Jepsen, though, I could pick out of a lineup. I feel yeah. like I've seen one million photos of Charlie XCX from our horny friends yeah. who love her. And I feel like I still have no idea what she looks like. Well, I think it's funny uh, where like, I was thinking about how Rita Ora shows up in one of the fast movies. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I need to type with that. Like, no, what about somebody I like? Oh, Charlie. It's Charlie, baby. I fully support Charlie XCX being in here. I'm not familiar with her work. I'm not familiar with her face. 
Um, but I think that's great casting. And Drake is uh, Scott Adkins, who is like a legendary martial artist stunt performer. Not Scott uh, Adsit from not Scott Adsit. 30 Rock. Different guy. Okay. I have made that mistake, though. It's really <laughs> funny. They could not be more different. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, he's just like a, he has like a podcast called The Art of Action. He talks to other stunt people. Uh, he has, he's also become the lead of a number of like direct to streaming type action movies. Okay. It would just be kind Great. of a treat to see him uh, in, in this with a role that's kind of comedic. Like well, and a I agree, mean like, way to describe him would be like a dime, would be like a dime store uh, Statham. But okay. like, don't tell him I said that because I don't feel <laughs> that kick way. your ass. I don't feel that way about Scott Ads. About Scott Ads. <laughs> <laughs> Scott we did it. God damn it. Um, I just felt like it's fun. It's, you, you wouldn't get Statham for this. It's too small a part. Right. I didn't want to pick any big stars other than like your pop star stunt casting because I wanted these to be not distracting. It also reminds me again of Near Dark because I'm assuming he's the oldest guy on the team. So yes. he's kind of in the Lance Hendrickson role. Yeah, exactly. Sort of in this group. Although, it's, funny, it's funny that Near Dark did not come into my head for this. And again, I haven't seen it. So I now have great. to. We're going to put it on the watch list. Yeah, uh, and viewers at home should track down Near Dark as well as the original Werewolf of London. And uh-huh. God, we really got to make mixtapes. Oh yeah, for these while movies. you're at it, just watch Strange Days. I think it's still on HBO. It's like the fucking greatest movie. Catherine Bigelow is great. Um, a lot of various uh, uh, content warnings in that movie, though. Please, if you have sensitivities, check that out first. It's really intense. And I do like. Uh, we can cut this if you don't want me talking about it. But we had talked a, a couple weeks ago that you had been toying with the idea of Gwen not being in this movie. Yeah, we can talk about this. Um, uh, Because here's, I will give the same explanation. Gwen is my favorite, like, from the beginning. She's, like, my first, like, these two characters' names come from the Wolfman 41, but, like, more or less are my original characters, and Gwen is clearly the contribution to this universe that I'm most passionate about. And that was becoming a problem in terms of trying to make this Larry's movie. So I had to kind of beat out this movie without Gwen first Mm. and then see and then reach a point where I'm like, oh no, here's what we're going to do with Gwen. Then it would work. And Gwen gets a lot of attention in the rest of the movie. Then it becomes both their movies. But it was really important to me to invest in Larry the way that I invest in Gwen. Yeah, and I think there's some great investment here. And what I told you when you told me is that I was like, the fans would riot. The fans would absolutely riot no, if we made a Wolfman is, sequel without I'm Gwen. I'm glad that you said that because it's the kind of thing where I'm like, I do have to remember we do have an audience that might care, right? Yeah, like, we, it's, we it's do a have, small audience, have, but you know. This oh, dark universe has fans. It's crazy. And gosh, we're so grateful. This is pretty early in the phase of people listening to us who we don't know. And was like, thank you all so much for your enthusiasm. It really means a lot. Yes. But winding back to this, uh, I was also thinking it might be an interesting sort of kind of inversion to like maybe do a thing where we we instead like I was like, do you want to use Gwen in one of the movies you have coming up instead? Because I know you're interested in writing her more. Uh, and I'm really glad I got that note from you because I'm. There, it's possible that I might have stuck with a version of this movie that did not have her in it. And as you're going to see with the rest of the script, that just it would not it wouldn't be. It would not be the same movie, and I'm really happy with what I have here. I'm really glad yeah. that, much like The Wolfman has them both, but is really more Gwen's movie, this movie has them both and is really more Larry's movie, but it has a lot for both of them to do, and it has a lot about their internal journeys. Yeah, I mean, can you imagine, though, like, even if this was a real film franchise, and first of all, you come out with a movie called The Wolf Man, uh-huh. but is double billed with a male and female werewolves, but the werewolf, the female werewolf never turns, never turns. and never gets to be a werewolf. Then she gets a shining moment in Dark Legion, which would get a lot of people to be, I think, solidify the Gwen fans. And then the studio announces a Wolfman sequel without her. Without yeah. her, well, people would, would be like, "That would be yeah. awful." Like the thing is, if you did not have a purpose, if you were specifically like, "I don't want to use Gwen in any of these movies," you have to do this in in this one. I was and like, I didn't have a place for yeah, her. Yeah, and as I was we starting to think, like, "Is there a role for her in one of these other ones?" Because I kind of want this to be like, "I'm so glad it turned out just as it is." Hopefully, you'll agree when we when we get through the rest of the movie. We're an hour into the show and a third way in the script, so we should probably I keep think, pressing. Yes, on. I, I think this is a, a great introduction for her, and I can't wait to see what happens um and it looks like we'll probably get some answers here at the top of act two act two we cut directly to the eyes of gwen conliffe played by amber mid thunder and pull back to see that she is dealing blackjack on the floor of a half full casino a customer on his way out examines her name tag and says have yourself a great night evelyn under a half moon gwen drives an old sedan out of the employee lot of the sun city casino in acoma pueblo a sovereign nation about 60 miles west of albuquerque new mexico After a quiet, lonely drive, she pulls into an RV park next to a silver bullet trailer. There's already another car pulled up next to it, a much nicer, newer one. Inside, her mother, Joe, played by legendary voice actor Cree Summer, 
is unloading food into Gwen's refrigerator. Gwen enters, tired. Her mom's bought groceries and ordered chalupas from that place she likes. Thanks, Mom. I I can pay you back. I have the money. I've just been too exhausted to go shopping. Gwen dramatically slumps over her mother's shoulder. You always have a home with us in Albuquerque. You know that, right? I know, and I miss it a lot. I just don't think it's a smart move. People know me there, and there's still a warrant out for me. Here I can lay low, and on the off chance I do get caught, there's at least a chance that Acoma will choose not to extradite. It's a long shot, but in a pinch, I'd rather deal with the tribal government than the cops. Is there a safe place around here for you to... Joe growls and makes a monster hand gesture. Wow. One of the werewolf shelters I helped out at last year is a couple hours away. Must be nice to go somewhere people know you. People you can trust not to turn you in. It is. It's a good community. Gwen gives her mom a peck on the side of her head. But it's not a family. Later, we see Gwen wave from the front step of her trailer while Joe's car drives away. Gwen sits in her open doorway, enjoying a chalupa. She's about to take a bite when something sets off an alarm bell in her head. She slowly and carefully reaches back, places the chalupa back in its bag, and then searches the opposite side of the doorway for something just out of our view. She's startled by the voice from around the corner of her trailer. Miss Conliffe? With lightning speed, Gwen pulls her hand back from inside the house, now holding a revolver. She aims at the stranger, who holds up his hands and slowly steps into the light. It's Dr. Yo, our mysterious scientist. Who the hell are you? I'm looking for Gwen Conliffe. That's you, yes? Traditionally, the person holding the gun asks the questions. Who are you? I'm Dr. Yo Ming An. I'm a scientist. Are you a surgeon? Because you're going to need one. I'm also a werewolf. Gwen sighs and lowers the gun. Inside, Gwen digs into that last chalupa at the fold-out table while Dr. Yo sits opposite her, making his case. Throughout his story, we intercut to scenes from his downfall. Nine years ago, I was looking ahead to a promising career in molecular plant biology, but all that changed after I was bitten by a werewolf while on an expedition. When my lycanthropic episodes began, I looked for support and understanding from my academic colleagues, but they dismissed me, thought me mad. Alone, I set out in search of the rare lunasynthetic flower Marifasia lupina lumina, hoping to find in it a cure for my disease. But this quest proved very expensive, and before long I was out of both money and hope. That's when he came to my rescue, or so it seemed. A benefactor with seemingly endless resources who invested heavily in my work. His name was Charles Lester. Chip? You know him? We've met. He's dead now. Yo lets out a huge sigh of relief. Oh, thank God. Yeah, he got run through by a shank that was concealed inside an invisible guy's asshole. Oh, wow. All right, then. Yo steadies himself and then continues his tale. For about a year, Chip was my only friend in the world. He had me flown around the globe to investigate promising flora and provided me with safe houses in which to transform each full moon. It was only once I learned what he really was that I realized what I had become, his prisoner. I was not working towards the liberation of my kind. I was a tool in Count Dracula's plans to subjugate us. Our flashbacks have now caught up with the opening scenes of Werewolves of London, with Dr. Yo finding the Marifasia in the mists of the Badline Mountain. Still, motivated by self-preservation, I continued my work under the vampire's supervision. At last, I had a breakthrough. As we saw earlier, Dr. Yo injects himself with his serum just as the full moon takes hold. His body throbs and he drops to his knees as the serum takes effect, halting and reversing his werewolf transformation. I had developed a treatment for lycanthropy, not a cure, but a serum that could be taken monthly to prevent my transformation into a mindless beast. My body was, at last, back under my control. The flashback continues, and Yo is being thrown into a secured laboratory. But this was only part of what Chip wanted from me. To him, a treatment was only a stepping stone on the way to something more sinister. He wanted me to reverse-engineer this cure into a poison that could induce a lycanthropic transformation on demand. I was forced to develop and manufacture this serum for them, and even to design more dangerous, weaponized variants. He flashed the climactic battle from The Wolfman, in which an induced Wolf Larry kills Martin Poole with his quicksilver-coated fangs and claws. I was held captive in their laboratory for years. But six months ago, everything changed. Yo is working in his lab, supervised by a pale woman dressed all in black. Suddenly, the woman screams and a pulse of red light bleeds through her skin. She disappears in a burst of flames, leaving only a pile of dust and crumpled clothes. Yo rifles through the pockets of her remains and finds a key card. He cautiously unlocks the door of his laboratory and peers out into a hallway, only to find that all of the guards and personnel there have been likewise turned to ash. He looks down the corridor and finds that there are several more cells, each with their own habitats and their own prisoners. 
Yo runs down the hall, stopping only for a moment to unlock each cell. One of these cells, lined with silver spikes, houses a striking figure portrayed by Joe Taslib of Warrior and the Raid. He smiles a toothy vampire smile, then vanishes. Could I be setting something up for a future film? Who's to say? <laughs> Yo and a handful of other prisoners exit the underground facility into a long, dark cave, eventually emerging into the daylight. Yo takes in the sun, which he hasn't seen in years, and then collapses. Men and women in hard hats and work clothes rush to his aid. We pull back and see that we are at a mining site in Talbot, California. To my surprise, the ones who found me first were my own people, werewolves who had secretly gathered in the mining town of Talbot, California. Their numbers and resources were not as plentiful as they used to be, but they were able to get me back on my feet and point me in the direction of someone who could help me pick up the pieces of my life. Now we're caught back up with the present, here in Gwen's trailer. Me? They told me that you're responsible for my escape. That you and your friends defeated Dracula and destroyed his army around the world. That's true. They also told me it's your fault that their secret clubhouse got raided by vampires. That's true. I'm supposed to tell you that April DeTuro says hello. Aww. And that she wants her van back. Oh, I don't have it anymore. I honestly couldn't care less. What's important to me is my research. When I escaped from my lab, I had only a handful of complete doses of my lycanthropy treatment. My captors were careful never to let me stockpile it, to dissuade me from attempting escape. I need to make more before the next full moon, but Dracula's accomplices at the Talbot Mining Company have retaken my lab, and I need specialized equipment to synthesize my serum. It would take too long to assemble what I need from scratch, but I believe that there's still one complete set of equipment secure in a safe deposit box in Cambridge. I hope you mean Cambridge, Massachusetts. No such luck, I'm afraid. Did April tell you that I'm a wanted fugitive? I can't just hop a flight to England. She accounted for that. Someone in your werewolf network is skilled at falsifying passports. Yo retrieves a passport from his coat pocket and places it on the table between them. Gwen opens it up and sees her own doctored mugshot. The name on the document is Van Bach, Wanda. Wanda Van Bach? What kind of name is... And she gets it. <sighs> Bitch, I don't have your van! I have to assume that there are still people hunting for me, either more vampires or the Talbot Company or God knows who else. It's not safe for me to travel alone. But if you can get me to Cambridge, I can finally apply my research towards the aim it was always meant for, a safe and stable treatment for lycanthropy. Gwen closes the passport, sinks back in her chair, and sighs. <sighs> I guess I'm calling out of work this weekend. We catch up with Gwen and Dr. Yo on a British Airways flight. Coach, of course. Oh, just like Nick Morton. Oh, we're sponsored this year. <laughs> this episode is brought to you by British Airways. I didn't spe specify the airways, but we have a lot of our monsters flying coach in this phase. I think we're gonna have to do it every one of these now. <laughs> so this treatment of yours, does it have any side effects? Technically, no. What do you mean, technically? The serum completely negates the unknown forces mutating their body, with the effects lasting about 30 days. So during that time, the subject is effectively human. So no more enhanced strength, heightened senses, so on? Correct. You wouldn't call that a side effect? I'd call it a comprehensive treatment that negates all symptoms of the disease. Why do you call it a disease? What else should I call it? I don't know. I, I guess condition sounds less icky, but I don't really like that either. It's just a part of me. I'm not interested in curing it. I have a few doses of the serum that triggers transformation in my luggage, if you'd prefer that. Oof, no thanks. I've been on that ride. Not a fan. Then why help me? When I got bit, I was with this guy. He got bit too. It seriously fucked up both of our lives, but for him, it was a nightmare. It cost him everything. His family, his status, everything, really. Don't get me wrong, this guy could stand to be taken down a few pegs, but it really messed him up. I've made peace with what I am. I, I even like it a lot of the time. But I know he would do anything to be the guy he used to be. He deserves that chance, if he wants it. Where is this guy of yours now? I don't know. Taking care of himself, probably. The airplane lands and we get a reprisal of the scene of Yo and Gwen arriving and walking through the airport, from their perspective. This includes their encounter with Rosie and her bag full of juicy fruit. Gwen pulls Yo onto his feet and loads him into a cab. After they've been on the highway for a while, Gwen turns to look through the back window. She eyes the bloodhound's van suspiciously, but dismisses her worry. Then there's a buzzing coming from Dr. Yo's coat pocket. He reaches for it reflexively, as we've all learned to do, but is startled when he retrieves a phone he doesn't recognize. There's a new text from Mum that reads, We need eggs. What the hell? This isn't my phone. Shit! That weirdo with the gum must have stuck it on us. We're being followed. Yo rolls down the window and prepares to toss the phone out. Hold on! I've got an idea. Driver, take the next exit, please. Doc, I'm gonna need something from your bag. 
The cab pulls off at the exit for Thrift Hill. On a side road between two plots of farmland, the car stops and Gwen gets out. If I don't catch up with you by tomorrow morning, keep running. Right. And Gwen? Thank you. The cab pulls away, and Gwen starts climbing a thick, tall tree that stands by the side of the road. As the headlights of the van come into view, Gwen perches on a sturdy branch and counts the passengers. Six people total. Too many to risk fighting in human form. She heaves a sigh and starts undressing, hanging her clothes on the branches around her. Holding Rosie's cell phone in her teeth, she readies a syringe of glowing silver serum. After a deep breath, she injects herself. Gwen's body wrenches violently in the branches. She bites down hard, cracking the glass of Rosie's cell phone before dropping it behind its unsuspecting owner. Her skin rips and tears, revealing a growing second body underneath. In mere seconds, she has become a large gray wolf whose thick fur is already stained with her own blood. Wolf Gwen pounces from the treetops, landing on Rosie hard. Once again, this is a reprise of the fight we've already seen, but now attached to Wolf Gwen's perspective. When Larry slashes her tail with his quicksilver pocket knife, she howls in pain and then contorts back into her human form as her six foes stand over her, mirroring the earlier shot of Larry waking up in the warehouse. Now, I have a question here. Hit me. Do we really think, after Gwen's experience in cluj Napoca, that she would voluntarily turn herself into a werewolf just because some people were following them? That seems as... It's a little bit sweaty, isn't it? She, she does have super strength already. She doesn't know the threat, and she can't control herself. The, the reason they transform at the end of Dark Legion is because they know they'll attack the vampires. Right. We kind of establish that that's like... And I guess maybe if... What I would maybe add here is some sort of red herring for Gwen to make her think that they're vampires on her trail. Okay, I like that. That, that's that helps a lot because I don't have another way to have this event happen. Because that's what they're worried about, right? Is yeah, that, like, they're probably being followed by vampires. So I think maybe if there was something about Rosie, maybe the fact that she has this retro style to her. Yeah, something pains. just something to make her think that, oh, shit, the vampires have caught up to us. So if I transform, it will be relatively safe because I'll only I'll attack the vampires okay. first. Kind yes, of thing. we have not locked it in. So let's add this beat in as an idea, because I you're completely right. Um, I, I, kind, also, I kind of let the the, the uh, I did that thing that we always criticize, which is I kind of let the action beat that I needed dictate the concision of a character there. <laughs> well, I, I do the same thing. And uh, my good friend, uh, Calvin Kosolke, who will be our guest on our next episode, always catches me doing that. Like this person would not do this like that. That's, you know, um, See, but I, I think this is I an always, easy way to justify. To it. be honest, I kind of always thought that this kind of thing would happen more often on our show where we would have to give feedback about. I don't know if that so and so works. I guess that now that we know each other's characters more. Yeah. Yeah. We're probably going to have it happen more often. And our characters have more history and stuff. I also think we need, dirt, while they're kind of exchanging exposition, we need, because you and I decided uh, after the Dark Legion that all of the vampires are toast, but only the ones of Dracula's lineage. Dracula's li- lineage. But the thing which is, means that there may be other vampire lineages. Yes, and I've introduced at least one other vampire in which, that escape sequence. Which is good because that shows us like, oh, not all the vampires burned away when Dracula's line did, but I think we need someone to make that distinction explicit. Like, it, maybe just while they're talking, you know, Gwen could be like, wait, but how was there a vampire right. left? And there he could be like, a, yeah. well, it's that lineage, you know, they're separate, you know, there vampire a, yeah. clans kind of thing. There was a thing. point where I was thinking about giving each of the groups incomplete information about what's happening with the vampires, that together they would know everything. Um, as a way to also kind of split up the info dump. I ended right. up not putting any of it in there. I think just just without it, Gwen would be like, oh, don't worry about it. There's no more vampires. You don't need me. Right. You know, like we took care of them. They're dead, you know. Uh, and so just one line, I think, would give sure. us enough. Right now, I'm kind of having to work under the assumption that characters, obviously the network of people in this world have figured out that they're seeing a lot fewer vampires or maybe no one has seen any vampires since then. But I didn't know how people would know that much detail except that i also put the whole thing about the familiars talking so it works they yeah. can they can know that information we can also retroactively pipe that in and i think it's a good thing to pipe in and i think say that like you that like most of the w- vampires in the world are gone because i don't want it to feel like the dark legion accomplished nothing like we just said yeah like oh yeah like it was a big ending but only some there's still a you oh, know three million worry, vampires in dracula in the world, lives you know? i'm like, gonna get into really detail about what's happened with vampires yeah i want to and i know you are i and i think if we're dumping that exposition in this movie we should just so the audience doesn't feel cheated let them know like 
oh, there's still just a few vampires left, you right. know. May, we don't have to define the number, but like well, Dracula they, they got won't most know of them, either, you right? Know? But the idea is that the the ruling class of vampires that have dominated the planet for X number of centuries, poof, they're gone. Yeah. And now something else has to happen. Mm-hmm. Um so and we'll get to that. But yes, that's another note. That really helps with this beat. So thank you. That's a really good note. Yes, of course. Um, So we're going to come back in just a second with the other half, with the second half of Act 2. We're going to roll to uh, see what's happening uh, around the uh, podosphere. Is that a thing? People say the podosphere? Everyone says that. Let's hear from another podcast over on the podosphere. Star Trek has never been just one thing. The ideas we associate with Trek are flexible, shifting and changing over time, depending on who is writing it, and even who is watching. In this sense, then, Star Trek itself is a mirror universe. Or to put it another way, Star Trek's real mirror universe is our universe. In the Star Trek Mirror Universe podcast, we reflect on Star Trek, the various and often conflicting things it's had to say, and the mirror it holds up to our world. Star Trek, like beauty, is in the eye of the beholder. The Star Trek Mirror Universe podcast with special guest star Dylan Roth. Available on iTunes, Spotify, and all good podcatchers. Live long and prosper. And we'll see you on the flip side. Gwen, dressed in her recovered clothes, regains consciousness in the back bench seat of the Bloodhound's van, crammed in between Drake and a bloodied Rosie. At first, she screams until Larry turns around from the middle row. It's okay. It's okay. It's me. Larry? What the fuck are you doing in England? And who are all these people? Chopa chimes in, followed by Rosie. We're the Brixton Bloodhounds. From Brixton! Do you want to explain to me why you were stalking Dr. Yo? We were trying to catch him so we could keep control of that wolf out serum that Chip and my mom dosed us with. What were you doing with him? I was protecting him so he could get some equipment to make treatment that prevents wolf outs. After a moment, they both speak, overlapping. I Which feel like maybe really we should be on opposite alley? teams. Yeah. Seems to me like we're all after the same thing. Seems like we all want the same thing. We won't keep control of our bodies, and Yo Ming On is the key to whether or not we have it or someone else does. If he'll help us willingly, I don't see any reason we can't join forces. Of course I'll help willingly. Why would he want to sell out his fellow werewolves? Dr. Yo's a werewolf? You can practically hear Jer's eyes rolling from the driver's seat. Do we know anybody who's not a werewolf? Honestly, who's left? Larry's Uncle Nigel is wandering his flat, pacing, killing time. He looks at his phone for the third time in the past 10 minutes. It's 1 a.m., no texts, no missed calls, just like before. He sighs, hesitates for a moment, then makes a call. Hey, it's Nige. Call me back when you get this. It's important. Bloodhound Gang continues north on the... <laughs> I know. You called them the Bloodhound Gang I did it on gang purpose. I did it's it on purpose. purpose. Okay, yes. it's not the, a slip up. The Bloodhound Gang continues north <laughs> of Cambridge. I didn't name them after the Bloodhound I did it because it was Brixton Bloodhounds and like a good name. But sweat, once, once baby, I realized sweat, what I'd done, baby, I had to put them... The, yes. drop me, kin. the Bloodhound Gang continues north to Cambridge where they meet up with a waiting Dr. Yo. After some apologies, the crews agree to join forces and continue Dr. Yo's mission to create more of his werewolf anti-serum. The device he built to synthesize more of the serum was stored away just as he'd hoped, but the specimen of Meraphasia lupin and lumina is long past its expiration date, and he'll need to acquire more. Dr. Yo lays out the two major obstacles in their path. First, Meraphasia only grows under very specific conditions, only at certain altitudes and in the mists of a cloud inversion. The United Kingdom only has one peak that might meet these conditions, Ben Nevis in the Scottish Highlands. The other challenge, the next full moon is only about 30 hours away, There's theoretically enough time to drive to Scotland, climb the mountain, but no guarantee that what they'll find when they get there. If they fail, the whole lot of them will transform in the wild, and then all bets are off. Shopa speaks for her gang. We're prepared to take the risk, but we need some sort of guarantee that you'll share your serums with us. Both of them. We want the trigger, the safety, and the means to make more. A lot more. This breakthrough belongs to all werewolves. You have the best guarantee you could possibly get. You have me. Get me where I need to go and keep me safe from any third parties that may try to interfere, and I'll happily oblige you. I have a car in storage here. Gwen and I will take point and lead you up to the base of the mountain. We'll make camp there tomorrow night, then start the climb in the morning. We'll have all of the next day to find the sample we need. There's no way I'm letting you out of my sight before we get our serum. You'll ride in the van with us. Gwen and Larry can follow behind in your car. I'm still not sure how much I can trust you two. And just to make sure you don't try anything funny, I'm sending you off with a chaperone. 
Cut to the interior of a sedan at daybreak. Larry's driving, Gwen sitting shotgun, and Drake is in the middle back seat, arms spread across the top of the bench. They've been on the road for a bit, following the van. It's been quiet, but Larry breaks the silence. So, uh, how are Jenny and Carol doing? Getting married. No way. Already? Good for them, I guess. Yeah, I'm supposed to invite you to the wedding if I ever run into you. They want the whole gang there. Well, maybe not Victor. Poor guy. Anybody seen, I mean, uh, heard from Jack? Nope. The Invisible Man is in the wind. Carol's been missing him a lot. Yeah, I'll bet. Another long pause. This is fucking weird. Yeah, dude. Everything's backwards. I keep reminding myself that we're not on the wrong side of the road. That's not what I meant. My mom's from here, remember? I used to drive in England every summer. I mean, you and me, together again. Oh, why would this be weird? Because we were sleeping together for like six months, and then you just stood there while your mom tried to murder me? Because of that, yeah. Yeah. Mostly. Yeah, it's a little awkward. I'm so sorry about that, Gwen. It was a really awful situation, but I should have had your back. I appreciate you saying that. I've had a lot of time alone to reflect. I was confused and terrified, but I was also selfish. I wasn't just choosing my mom over you. I was choosing myself over you. The idea that I could just erase everything that happened since we met and go back to being a sheltered rich kid. Even if that was possible, the idea that it would cost you your life should have made it an easy no. I'm so angry at myself for even hesitating. Larry has finished his speech. He waits a few seconds, anticipating a response. And when he doesn't get one... And how about you? What about me? Do you have anything you want to say to me, maybe? Such as? Such as, sorry I abandoned you in a strange country right after your mom died? Gwen says nothing. Unfucking believable After an extended awkward silence, the long-forgotten Drake slowly leans forward from the back seat and clicks on the radio. He slides back out of view to the tune of One Direction's Night Changes. (laughs) Jesus. (laughs) We cut to an aerial shot of the two vehicles crossing into Scotland. <laughs> I couldn't resist. <laughs> it's it had to do it. Night changes. You you better make a soundtrack album for this that's just all werewolf pun music. There's going to be a lot of them. Yeah. Anyway, they're nothing but mammals. It's nightfall, and both cars park in a secluded spot at the base of Ben Nevis to set up camp. Let's just assume they stop somewhere along the way to pick up all this mountaineering equipment as well as a few beers. The not-quite-full moon hangs overhead, and the eight lycanthropes mill around a tall campfire, split into smaller conversations. Shopa breaks off from drinking with her gang to sit next to Larry, who's drinking alone. So, that's the famous Gwen. She the reason you and I didn't shag the first night we met? No, we didn't shag the first night we met because you pounced on me like a loose football. Are you guys not having the whole consent discourse on this side of the Atlantic? Apparently not. I've never known a man to put up a fight, to be honest. Especially a wolf, man. We usually can't keep our hands off each other. Okay, that's part of it, though. To you, I could be anyone. Any werewolf, at least. And back before all this started, I had the sweet ride, the big house on the hill. Ladies would line up. Even little Miss Marxist over there wanted a taste. And then, the next thing I know, we're going through this crazy, horny, traumatic adventure together. My money's gone, but now we have the wolf thing. Take that away, too? And what am I to her? What am I to anyone? See, if I felt that way, I would especially not want to turn down a quick anonymous fuck. Well, trust me, it wasn't easy. Still isn't. We pan over to a parallel conversation happening between Gwen and Yo on the opposite side of the campfire. I take it he's the guy you were talking about on the plane. Yep. So why are you sitting over here with me? We were just in a car together for six hours. And it didn't go as you hoped. No, it went exactly like I hoped. He apologized, owned up to his mistakes, demonstrated a lot of emotional growth. And? And I didn't give him an inch. Why not? I don't know, man. Why should I have to? Does he know that you came all this way for him? Hey, I'm in it for the cause, Doc. That's not what you told me on the plane. How much could it hurt for him to know this? Man, are you a biochemist or a psychologist? I'm a man who spent eight years imagining every conversation he wished he could have with the people he loved. Gwen takes a swig of beer and looks out across the fire at Larry. We return to Larry and Shopa's conversation. Well, Wolfman, I'm about to make this either a lot harder for you or a lot easier. What do you mean? Shopa directs Larry's attention to where the rest of the Brixton bloodhounds are drinking. Rosie is straddling Casper while Jer, behind her, kisses her neck and lifts her top over her head. It's Tuesday. (laughs) 
On the other side of the campfire, a shirtless Drake saunters over and extends a hand down to Dr. Yo. Yo looks at Gwen, then up at his suitor. He takes Drake's hand, and Drake lifts him to his feet and leads him to the patchwork of blankets where his cohorts are already piling on top of each other. Gwen looks across at Larry again and sees that Shopa is leaving his side and walking towards the party. As Shopa walks away, Larry turns towards Gwen, and their gazes meet. Gwen takes a breath and a swig of her beer, never breaking eye contact, then rises, plucks her shoes off her feet, and starts in the direction of the orgy. Her eyes stay on him the whole walk over, and Larry gradually finds his nerve. He puts down his empty beer bottle, throws his jacket over it, and steps into the firelit frenzy. We crossfade between the various shifting couplings that take place throughout the night, some tender, some ferocious. But when the fire has died down, Gwen and Larry have fallen asleep in each other's arms. Across the campsite, Larry's phone buzzes in his jacket pocket. Back in London, Nigel shakes his head and hangs up the phone. He turns to a man sitting drinking tea in his kitchen. Still nothing. I can't believe he's gone and disappeared again. I'm sorry. I thought maybe I could help put things right. The visitor's identity is revealed. It's John Talbot, Larry's father. You've done plenty, old friend. For the first time in months, I've got a trail to follow. Between Larry and the grocery girl, there should be enough breadcrumbs for my people to locate my son and bring him home at last. End of act two. We got Jared Harris in this motherfucker. And we he's got the Jared only one Harris. doing an American accent. Yeah, well, you know what? One of them had to be American. I know. It, it's 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 a holdover from the last movie. Yeah. They're a California mining empire that goes back generations. And I had Tandaway Newton as his British mother. So one of them had to be Jared Harris can makes, do an American accent. It's just it's just it, absolutely it's just funny to have Jared Harris in a movie <laughs> in London where he's He's not doing an American accent. accent. I know. It's <laughs> Uh, there's a lot of really great character work in this act two. Um, Thank you. I love all the stuff you're doing with Gwen and Larry. I really like the changes to Gwen. Gwen is very clearly a different person than she was in the first one. And, and that's good because we can see how the events of the Dark Legion have changed her where she's not quite as much like, I mean, we talked about annoying leftists. Like she's mm-hmm. not just like every other sentence out of her mouth is like politics and, and action. So she's like, She's now seen like sort of the, not that she was ever wrong. Of course, like, no, I, I want to be clear. A, like, but Gwen was very correct. So but it's like, very easy for me, someone who has never been like in the shit. I've never been in a protest that went like, I've never been in a protest protest that turned into like a conflict with the police. I've never been. I've never been in the shit really. Right. So it's easy for me to talk about fucking theory all the time. She's now had to live. A real She's life. She's now able to let her politics be actions instead of just words that she feels compelled to say every other sentence. Yes, you know. and it's the kind of thing where, like, before, the thing that she had to kind of identify as herself is, I am a leftist activist, mm-hmm. right? And so she has to put that forward really far. She doesn't have anything to prove to herself now. So she can kind of just live it and be a person. Yeah, and and uh, I also think this is a sort of similar reflection on you as a writer, because we've talked about how you... You've said yourself you tend to be very kind of didactic in your scripts with your politics and yeah. stuff. But this movie doesn't really have that, you know? Like, Wolfman and Jekyll and Hyde both had, like, were very political screenplays where a lot of their message had to do with the politics of them. And I think this one is more comfortable. You're you're more comfortable letting the politics lie in between the spaces of your movie instead of it being the thrust of the movie. Yeah, and I'm, I'm happy it turned out that way. Like, obviously, you can draw parallels from the idea, okay, here is... Um, here is a resource that um, h- uh, helps you to retain control of your body on a monthly basis. That is, you know, so yeah, I caught that, but it's it's subtle. It's not like yeah, it's not, you know, I I almost feel bad for how many times someone talks about trying to control their body, right? Mm-hmm. Like maybe that's a little bit too on the nose, but I didn't do it too often. I don't think. Yeah, and it's the but kind it's, of thing where the even if in like a rewrite or something you took out some of those exact phrasings the message would still be there um and i also decided not to make it like i didn't shape the entire story around okay i want to make this about how they're trying to fucking take away birth control (laughs) um it ended up being like okay the the uh the the device that i got from the where from werewolf of london the old movie and combined with the serums that we had kind of created the idea of you know, I talked a lot about how I don't want there to ever be a permanent cure for anybody. Yeah. But it, and I actually, I don't even think I would have used the, per, the word permanent before. I think no cures for anybody. They're all freaks and monsters now and their life is hard. But this was kind of just something I, 
I, I was able to kind of adopt from Werewolf of London and be like, this works within the themes that I work with in these characters. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I think that mostly what's been guiding it is like once I figured out where Gwen fit into the story and how we could work her narrative in there, it's like, no, I kind of just want it to be about the two of them and have uh, explore what they mean to each other. And I think that's really working. I do have some notes. Please I have me. some more Act 2 notes. Yeah. Number one, the ticking clock isn't urgent enough. Mm-hmm. Right now, they're like, we have to get there in the next 30 hours or else we transform like we do every month. Like it's, they are werewolves uh-huh. and we have seen them, you know, many of them have had this for years. And so the worst case scenario, if they don't accomplish their goal in time, is they have a standard month, you know, or maybe the 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 thing is like, okay, maybe they're not in their safe places that they would go to like chain themselves up. Mm-hmm. But if that's the case, why wouldn't they just be like, hey, why don't we wait like four days? And then we have a whole month to figure that we, we can just hang out here and transform normally. And then we'll have a whole month to go get this taken care of because there's not really, at least, unless I'm missing something, there's not any other rush the, to get this done in the next 30 hours. The only rush really, and I get into it a little bit later, has to do with um, Dr. Yo's own real fear of transforming again. And I haven't le- leaned on it that hard yet. I mean, uh, I have a scene later that gets a little bit more clear about it. I, I, He's I, the the clock is for him. He never wants to be a werewolf again. Yeah, and I, I definitely got that he he hates it, and yeah. he's worked on this, and he doesn't want to do it. But I think either that needs to be a conversation that they have, where he's like, "Hey, we need to do this now," and everyone's like, "Why?" Like we've got it's actually kind of stupid for us to do it now because we're uh-huh. gonna be all transforming tomorrow night. Mm-hmm. So. It's way smart. And he's like, hey, I don't want to fucking do that. Mm-hmm. And But even then... Yeah, and he's actually has the position of leverage to be like, that's the deal. You get me there in time or you don't get the shit. Yeah, so that's one way of doing it, being like, well, he's got... But even then, like, if, if he was going to do that, like, I don't know that I would believe him because mm-hmm. he's going to do this. He needs to it's do this like regardless. It's not like he's not going to develop it, yeah. I he's also like, kind of at their mercy. So that's a, good, that's a good note. And I don't know that we have to fix this right now, but I would say that maybe even like... The first thing that came to mind is like, okay, he's been doing all these experiments. What if he's done enough exper like Chip has forced him to do enough experiments on his body that actually transforming is killing him. Uh-huh. And his whole thing is like, if I transform again, it might be the last time. Like, and and that's maybe a little similar to my mummy thing too, where it was mm-hmm. like, the more I use my powers, the more it's killing me. That's also kind of that's you a, know, it's, it's apropos kind of for these monster, monster thing. movies. You know, uh, it's incompatible like, with something I have a little bit later. Yeah, so maybe that's not the answer, and I don't think we necessarily need to find it. But my feedback would be, I think, to really feel like to have the audience feel the clock that they're under, we need to have some like strong consequences for uh-huh. it. Um, and right now, it's just kind of feeling like, oh well, they'll have their standard moon menses, as we call it in the Dark Legion. As you call as it. As I call I've it, yet to use mine. the term moon menses. <laughs> um, um, uh, so, all right. So the other thing where I think I, I think maybe I would want to backtrack and figure out is to, cre- is to create the constant threat of a third party chasing him, to have somebody on their heels the whole time. Well, that is also the actually the other thing I was going to bring up as my feedback is we have some really great character stuff that happens here, but what we don't have in our act two that is that I think we need is rising action, Mm -hmm. right? In fact, at the beginning of Act 2, our threat is dissipated. Uh, We find out that, you know, they were hunting Dr. Yo, who they thought was a villain. Turns out they're all on the same side. We spend all of Act 2 with everyone being friends. Yeah. Um, We don't actually have any rising threat. We don't really have any action sequences... Other no. than some flashbacks. No, we really just have the orgy for the most part. I, yeah, I, which I, I do want to sh- shout out. Props to you. Are the first sex scene in the Dark Legion, or uh, in the Dark Universe, well, I think, okay. that we've you, had. We do have um, uh, Abraham Van Helsing and Mina Harker fucking each other <laughs> yeah. to death in the teaser uh, yes. of House of Dracula. We have had some, this is some the first, horniness. This is the first entirely... Uh, consensual sex scene. We also scene had that Zoe had. Kravitz attempting to have, have sex, sex a couple times, yes, but, but failing. I, I'm actually really happy with... Um, we're currently it could it could be it could have come and gone already by the time you hear this. We're in another round of the sex scene discourse on film Twitter where a lot of young people who have the who have the the best intentions about trying to have conversations about uh about uh consent and body autonomy are picking the weirdest arguments about why there shouldn't be sex scenes in movies. Uh was not not gonna lie, that was a factor here. We uh, are pro these monsters fuck. These monsters fuck. But also I wanted to find a scenario where uh I wanted to be able to create create an intimacy again between Larry and Gwen 
that um, would also be easy enough for them to not look at as a big deal because it's this group sex situation. It's, it's clearly very kind of casual. They kind of get to have their cake and eat it too. They have sex again. Clearly like they fall asleep together. There's, there is an element to which there's obviously like very, there's it's emotional and it's intimate, but it's also very easy for them to be like, well, we were all just having a good time. Yeah. So, um, which allows me to, 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 um, but I also kind of, that's sort of what I was hoping would work as the climax of my act too, is like, we don't have the physical stakes changing, but we have, we have kind of brought their relationship to a no pun intended climax. Right. I think you have, so, and I think that actually does work as a climax for act two. I think just along with this character arc, we also need plot arc happening. Okay. And right now, uh, the plot sort of disappears for act two where yeah. again, like they're going on an adventure together, but there are no, there's no urgency. There's no stakes. There's no one opposing them. Everyone's just sort of working. Like they may have interpersonal conflict sort of, mm-hmm. uh, I wouldn't take anything out that you have here. And th- again, this is also partially my fault because I was encouraging you, you to, to yeah, keep. I, I mean, I didn't cut anything that you're talking about here. Like I didn't, I did trim this by about 10 pages between the last couple of days, but uh, try and make the podcast, which is now running about an hour and a half, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> uh, but it's, um, no, you're right. I think that we need we need um, to maybe introduce the threat of John earlier in the act. We need to have something have looming over some this. Some kind of thing to push them forward. I don't even think they need to know about it because we want to have this moment of quiet so they can have their tumble Tuesday. I even think though, you know, this could be, it almost feels like the first half of our act two, where yeah. we sort of like we did with the dark Legion. We have in the dark Legion house of Dracula, we had these two lull periods, right? Where yeah. like everyone was in the bunker. Um, we had a lot of character dynamic work. This feels like that where right. like, but we, we would then have to have a part where it's the equivalent to our like uh siege of the prodigium. We base. need some set pieces. Yeah. This is my actual midpoint. The whole flashback thing showing from Gwen's perspective is all is just like act two, act one comma two. Yeah. And then act two doesn't really start until we wake up with her. This is our first half of act two. And then we have more to go, which in this, telling of the story will be essentially absent. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, yeah, I think character stuff is great. We just need more of the action in the rising action and mu- more to keep uh, people on the edges of their seats, you know, and yeah. wondering what's going to happen next because until that reveal at the end of Act 2, we're kind of just like, oh, well, what's going to happen next is I guess they'll go up and they'll be fine and they'll find their flower and if they don't, then they'll transform and then they'll do it tomorrow. Right, so <laughs> now I think we have a little bit what you're looking for coming up in Act 3. I'm but, sure, but uh, you're right. It needs it needs a little. It needs needs more. Mm-hmm. But that's part of what the podcast is, and these are always abbreviated pitches. Yes, but and I'm happy I that in this case, the, the more that it needs is during Act Two, and not missing an entire third act the way that the Wolfman was. <laughs> well, we will see as we dive in to Act Three. Act Three. At sunrise, the werewolves get dressed, pick up their gear, and start up the mountain. We crossfade through snippets of their journey as the climb intensifies from a hike for tourists to a true mountaineering adventure. The trek up Ben Nevis would be too difficult for most novice climbers, but thanks to their enhanced strength and endurance, they're able to manage the perilous journey with relative ease. Only Dr. Yo is struggling, thanks to the effect of his serum. At one point, he stumbles, but Drake offers him a hand up. We see the Brixton Bloodhounds and company help each other across hazards and up the steepest face of the mountain. As they venture deeper and deeper into the range, they're surrounded by some spectacular, idyllic landscape. It's some real Lord of the Rings shit. (laughs) The earth beneath their feet has changed from lush green to snowy white, and they approach a layer of cloud cover. They walk into a dense, disorienting layer of mist, in which the members of the party begin to lose sight of each other. Dr. Yo retorts to his companions, Don't worry, it's much worse on the way down. Before long, however, the party ascends above the mists and finds themselves sandwiched between a perfectly clear blue sky and a cotton blanket of clouds. It's a truly awe-inspiring sight, and Jarrah, Rosie, and Casper take a moment to hold each other and look out over the vista. Larry smiles, and then looks for Gwen, who is also taking in the view. She doesn't look back at him, until she notices that he's smiling at her. She smiles back, but with a hint of embarrassment. She urges the team to keep moving, as they leads a search the vicinity for marifasia plants. The team spreads out, searching around the edge of the cloud cover and looking for isolated pockets of mist. For a while, they don't find a sign of anything, and as the sun arcs overhead, they begin to feel the pressure of time. Dr. Yo, still flanked by Drake, digs through another promising patch of land to no avail. We've got to find something in the next hour if we want any hope of staying human tonight. When was the last time you transformed? Yo does some math in his head. 
April 2017, I think. My captors denied me my medicine once. They were punishing me for something, and I don't even remember what. And if you transform tonight, that's God's punishment, then. When did you become a philosopher? I ain't just a fine hunk of meat, Doc. I've been halfway around the world twice. I've studied every kind of faith and meditation there is. I don't know if there's a God, but if there is, I'm damn sure he doesn't want you to hate what you are. Or be afraid of it. I wish I felt that way, but I don't want to see the beast in me. I don't want anyone to see it. That's too bad. I bet he's beautiful. Yo smiles sweetly at Drake, who cups his face in his hand. Isn't halfway around the world twice just once around the whole world? Ah! Drake rolls his eyes and walks ahead, chuckling. Yo laughs and follows him. Elsewhere, Rosie is inspecting a pool of mist and spies something blue. She kneels down and blows a hole in the mist around her. There it is, a blue, tulip-shaped flower. She calls for the gang, and they join her, searching the immediate vicinity. Casper wanders a bit away from the group and then drops into the mist with a shout. Jer runs after him and stops short at a crater-like edge. He steps carefully down into it and finds Casper kneeling into a veritable garden of Marifasia lupin illumina. He howls in celebration, and the rest of the crew soon joins in, dancing and embracing. Shopa leads Dr. Yo into the valley. All right, Doc. It's your moment of glory at last. Dr. Yo takes his custom serum synthesizer out of his pack and begins his work. As we saw on Balang Mountain, Yo's device heats and grinds a blue petal and combines it with a specially formulated fluid. He holds the produced vial closely and waits for it to emit the telltale silver light. Finally, it does, which prompts another round of kisses and high fives from the Brixton Bloodhounds. Dr. Yo addresses the party. There may be variables I'm unaware of, but I'm fairly confident that this serum is chemically identical to the one I've been taking. We're a decent sample group for testing, too, spread out in age, race, sex. I'll get to work synthesizing enough doses for all of us. Jerry speaks up. What if we don't all want it? We all have to take it. There's not enough time before sundown to get down the mountain. If any one of us transforms, it puts the rest of us in immediate mortal danger. Not to mention any other climbers that might be within striking distance. Gwen puts a supportive hand on Yo's shoulder. I hate to admit it, but he's right. We're all going to have to bite the Quicksilver Bowl tonight. Gwen volunteers to go first. Dr. Yo prepares a syringe of the silver fluid and injects her. The injection makes her weak and lightheaded as her wolf strength fades. One by one, the werewolves take their shots, some reluctantly, some eagerly. They support each other through their initial weakness, eventually evening out. Finally, Yo injects himself. All right, we're finished. A baritone voice echoes from above. An excellent choice of words, doctor. A dozen uniformed men carrying assault rifles emerge from the mist around the circumference of the valley, guns at the ready, surrounding the wolf pack. Casper throws his hands into the air. Don't shoot! We're just normal men! Oh, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> quite right, young man. Normal and quite defenseless. The source of this voice, John Talbot, descends into the valley. I never imagined you'd make it this easy for us. Larry is in shock. Dad? John blows right past the other werewolves and embraces his son. I never thought I'd see you again. I missed you so terribly. I missed you too, Dad. Larry gently but firmly steps out of the hug. But what are you doing here? Obviously, I'm here to bring you home, Larry. To put this whole nightmare behind us. You don't need a SWAT team to do that, Dad. Let my friends go. John's tone shifts sharply. Do you mean your friend who's a fugitive from a secure Talbot facility? Or your friend who helped to murder my wife? Gwen chimes in. I didn't murder your wife, Talbot, but I'm sure not sorry she's dead. Gwen? Wake up, Larry. Your mother was helping an immortal sociopath seize power over life and death, and daddy here is just as culpable. Your entire empire is built on a foundation of blood. My empire has no foundation at all, thanks to you. Without Dracula's organization to protect our interests, the Talbot Mining Company has become the target of lawsuits, regulation, and unionization. Larry will be lucky if there's anything left for him to inherit. Good! Gwen, let me and my dad talk, okay? This doesn't have to involve anyone else. Just let them all go. They're not a threat to you. Jer steps forward. The hell we're not. Bloodhounds, let's... Slam! The shot rings out, and Jer stops cold, but he's unharmed. Casper drops to the ground, dead. Rita kneels down to hold his hand as he passes. Jer starts to move too, but is warned off by a guard. Jer snarls and sniffles. You cruel, bloody bastard. Why him? Why not me? John steps forward beside Dr. Yo, who has dropped his equipment bag to the ground. You're not likely to try anything again, are you, if it means watching more of your friends die? We prefer to take the rest of you alive. We're going to need as many specimens as possible, after all, if Dr. Yo is going to continue his research. I will do no such thing. Not again. You're going to have to kill me. 
And are you willing to condemn the rest of your new pack to death? Chopa stands firm. If it's between that and helping you defang werewolves around the world, then yes, we die for that. And you, Larry, my son, would you lay down your life for these creatures? Larry steps to within three inches of his father's face, stands tall, and looks him dead in the eye. Yes. Yes, I would. Behind him, Gwen's eyes well up with tears and a sad, proud smile curls on her face. John bites back his own rage and grief. That's it, then. That's it? John pulls Larry in for one more tight, desperate hug. He chokes back tears. Please, son. Not after your mother. Don't leave me alone. I love you, Dad. And I'm sorry. Larry kicks over Dr. Yo's equipment bag, and a syringe loaded with white fluid rolls towards Yo. Yo recognizes it, dives, and immediately injects himself. The guards, confused, divert their attention towards Yo, who starts convulsing in the dirt. The mist and clouds above part, revealing that night has fallen, casting the light of the full moon into the valley. Yo has dropped the syringe near John's feet. He bends down to pick it up and rolls it in his hands. There's a Talbot corporate logo engraved in the plunger. This is not one of the this is not one of the doses that Yo just prepared. This came from the laboratory. John darts to his feet. Open fire! But it's too late. Yo Ming An bursts loose from his own skin, a glorious and terrifying canine beast with a dark black mane. The guards take aim. The gang looks up agape, and Drake's eyes sparkle with wonder. Just before the bullets start flying, Larry yells, Run! Talbot's guards spray bullets at Wolf Yo, which only enrages the beast. His claws rip Kevlar and rend flesh, and in moments he's maimed three of the guards and crunched a fourth and a half between his jaws. While the gunmen are distracted, Larry, Gwen, and the surviving Brixton Bloodhound scramble out of the valley and run in the back in the direction they came from. But it's dark now, and the moonlight is scattering through the mist, making it hard to get one's bearings. Soon, the crew loses track of each other and their way home. The patter of gunfire echoes through the mountains, its tempo decreasing as more of the guards fall silent. We cut between three different sets of depowered werewolves, each unable to see the other through the soup. Jer and Rosie pull each other along, both still reeling from the death of Casper. Chopa and Drake stand back to back, nervously surveilling their surroundings. Larry and Gwen are each alone at first, then find each other. They both turn at once to face the sound of a long, low growl, which is loud enough to catch the attention of all three groups. Breathless, Gwen speaks softly to Larry. Larry, I'm sorry. You don't have to be. I made up my own mind. I know. And I love you for that. Larry smiles at Gwen and smiles back. They join hands as the sound of the growl grows louder. I'm sorry I abandoned you in a strange country right after your mom died. I love you too. They kiss. Then, the click of a pistol's safety. John Talbot holds a gun to Gwen's head. The lovers pull away from their kiss, still holding hands. They each look into John's teary eyes. He's a man with nothing to lose. Or, rather, one thing. His eyes turn towards Larry, his son, his last remaining family. And, wordlessly, John makes a choice. He points the pistol up to the sky and starts shouting, Over here! Over here! Dad, what are you doing? John backs away from Larry and Gwen and finds a place to stand about ten feet clear of them. He peeks back behind him, then plants his feet. Right here! Come fetch, you mangy bastard! The wolf emerges slowly from the mist, stalking closer to John. John aims his pistol. Dad! John whispers to himself, Rita, here's hoping there's a hell. John fires his pistol at Wilfio, who pounces at him at full speed, tearing through his prey and sailing over the edge of a cliff, falling through the pillowy cloud layer and down hundreds of feet below. Gwen, Larry, Chopa, Drake, Rosie, and Jer find each other at the edge of the cliff and look down at the stillness of the cloud ocean. It's over. At Casper's funeral, the surviving gang each lays a blue marophagia onto his casket before it's lowered onto the ground. Dr. Yo is still missing, but the bloodhounds have recovered his equipment and used it to create hundreds of doses of the lycanthrope safety serum with the intent to distribute it across England's werewolf network. Gwen plans to take the device back with her to the States so that Dr. Jennifer Halsey can figure out how it works and make more. After the funeral disbands, Gwen and Larry take a moment alone on a platform in the London underground. You sure you don't want to come back to the States? You can crash with me in my trailer for a bit if it hasn't been repossessed. Tempting as that is, I think I'm where I need to be for now. The bloodhounds are down a man, and... Oh, and you'd hate to miss Tumble Tuesdays. Larry laughs, laughs this off. And there's someone in town who I think deserves more of my time. Not to say that you don't, but... I get it. You gotta take care of the family you have left. 
Later on, though, since we're both going to Carol and Jenny's wedding, do you want to maybe go together? Let's see. Do I, a single bisexual woman, want to bring a man to a lesbian wedding? I'll pass. A train pulls into the station, making it too loud to talk. Instead, Gwen pulls Larry in for a deep, smiling kiss. The train doors open, and Gwen steps backward inside. I will save you a dance, though. The two werewolves smile at each other as the train doors close. Alone, for now, Larry walks home from the station. We cut to a familiar kitchen. Someone's cooking eggs and steeping tea. It's Larry, who lays a plate and a cup in front of Uncle Nigel. He sits across from him, his own side of the table empty this time. Where do you want me to start? The beginning, I suppose. Okay, then. Last October, I dropped by the campus bookstore to pick up a biology textbook, and there was this girl working there. We pull back from the table as Larry tells Nigel the story of the Wolfman and track through Nigel's house across a wall of family photos until we finally pause on the one of Nigel, Rita, John, and Larry on the old fishing boat. Fade to black. mid credit stinger! Yeah, let's it's get morning. those teases. It's morning in the Scottish Highlands. A naked man sits up abruptly, as if from a nightmare. It's Dr. Yo ming -on. He scans his surroundings and, seeing no one, stands up. He looks over his head and sees the cliff that he fell from, hundreds of feet above him. He starts to giggle, then finally throws his arms in the air and lets out a wild, cackling laugh and howls into the sky, thrilled to be alive. Now we finally hear Warren Zevon's <laughs> Werewolves of London over the remaining credits. Ah, uh, ooh! <laughs> post credit stinger, because you gotta have one. Of course! The Franchise, baby! The escaped vampire prisoner from earlier in the film, played by Joe Taslim, sits cross-legged and bare-chested in a martial arts exercise room. His eyes are closed. This scene is presented in subtitled Indonesian. Everything that was once mine will be mine once again. My lands, my titles. With Dracula dead, there is no one left on Earth who can stand against me. From off screen, a servant speaks. My liege, that is what I've come to tell you. The situation is more complicated than we were led to believe. Sir, Dracula lives. Tatham's eyes open and flash with fury as we cut to black. I love that. Putting the title of the next <laughs> movie in this movie. Not the next movie. Could not resist. Definitely. Could not resist. I love that. I love that. All right. I'll say it first. Act three is a little short. Here, I've got some notes. Okay. Uh, first of all, I love the arc. I love the... I love that... Larry's dad's end is different from his mom's where mm -hmm. Larry's dad actually does make the choice to save Larry. I think that's good because bringing back Larry's dad so soon, you wouldn't want it to have it just be a repeat of the Rita showdown, yeah. right? And I think this does a good job. We just need more of him in the movie so it feels like something. Here's, I hate to give this note, that's your end of act two. No! I'm so no! sorry. I'm so no! sorry. But what happens is, because here's the thing. You've got your villain showing up. You've got Jared Harris showing up in the scene, in the final scene. And then he has to have this whole arc where by the end of it, he's killing himself to save his son in one action sequence. Yeah. We need more time. So here's what happens. We do all the stuff in act two. We have all the character stuff. They get up to the mountain and somehow... They lose. And because Dr. Yo disappears, right, because he was th the reason it was urgent, uh -huh. we follow them back to London, and our act three takes place in the streets of London with a werewolf rampage. It is called Werewolves it's of called London. Werewolves of London. We only and we have spend, one sequence in London. There is a single chasing where everyone but, is human in that chasing. That's true. There and are I, no werewolves it, it in not, London. It does not <laughs> fucking escape me that this time Larry never becomes a werewolf in the script. Mm -hmm. I decided that was okay because it kind of even things out <laughs> with Gwen last time and because we still get a big werewolf scene at the end. Uh, I, th yeah. I think a lot of your final character beats here could be transitioned. In, there's still act three character beats, but the problem is, like, like I said, our villain gets introduced in probably 15 minutes before the end of the movie, mm -hmm. and there's not really a chance... His turnaround is too quick. Yeah. Um, because we don't have enough menacing stuff. I'm also, I also think maybe our rising action in the middle could help us solidify a little bit what everyone wants. Because I'm starting to get a little fuzzy on what all the bloodhound people want from Dr. Yo and his serum, right? Because uh. the serum cures lycanthropy. They make it clear that not everyone, not all of them want that. 
Yeah, and in the beginning, they're mostly interested in the trigger. They want to be able to transform when they want to, and it's so half- they do want the trigger. They, they okay. want the trigger. They mostly want to keep it out of the hands of anybody else, but they also want to have it. I the think, idea is they want full autonomy over their werewolf state. I think what you've set up here is a really great ideological conflict among the werewolves, which mm-hmm. is some of them, like Dr. Yo, are like, this is a, cur- a curse. I mean, you basically expanded the Larry Gwen dynamic yeah. into a larger group. And that's group. something that I wanted to do, and I have to admit, all right, I can't completely pass on the blame because it's not my fault that I got to the end of Act 2 and had 45 pages, <laughs> and he's like, well, I have to wrap this up. And I did not have enough time to go back and rewrite the entire thing, even though we gave ourselves more time this time. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to completely pass the buck. Some there's there's a principle that says there are no third act problems. There are only second act problems, right? Mm -hmm. Anything that doesn't work in the third act because you did not properly set it up in act two. So I have a second act problem. We've established that already. I think so. I, and like I, I also said, like, uh, again, as a going back to my, the fan me at the beginning, I would be bummed if I didn't see the werewolves set loose in London. Yeah. Even an American werewolf in London has the big final set piece in the London streets. Okay. You know? So I think maybe what we would have happen. I still think Gwen leaves here. Maybe. What do you mean? <sighs> I don't know. If we're imagining that the uh, fucking mountaintop sequence is mm-hmm. actually our end of Act 2. Which, yeah. And I that's going to become our sort of low point. Because I now, it's funny, like, because you're the first person, really, who's talking to me about this critically, like, I write this, and then I bring it to you, other than I read some mm-hmm. stuff aloud to my wife to see how it sounds. And she gives me those. She's a smart reader. But um, it's not, you know, she's she's not on the show. It's not she's, <laughs> She doesn't have to get that invested. Right. In it, right. Um, is... I don't really have a big low point for our characters. It's pretty smooth sailing. It's pretty smooth sailing. (laughs) Um, So that's the thing. Like that's why I think they need to lose. You know, like but you know, I always think that's where you know, because you have Casper dying, but then you know, five minutes over, five five minutes later, the movie's over. Right. One of the things I always do when I'm plotting out and I realize what my act three is going to be is I pause and I go, okay, now what's the act three of that act three? Uh And I always think, how could I push this even farther? Because I think, especially for blockbuster stuff, you want to keep heightening and heightening and heightening so people leave feeling very satisfied by how big it got. Even if it's not world-shattering stakes, the character stakes need to keep getting higher and higher. And so I always think, how could I... How could I es- elevate this even a little bit more and and drive this home a little further? And I think that's the sort of thing where, like, yeah, it's smooth sailing, and then they win. Like, there's, they're never, none of our characters are really challenged by anything other than interpersonal conflict, but they're not challenged by the plot, right? You know. Um, and so, gosh, this is the hard thing about one of the things I think is cool about the show is that we bring in these fairly rough drafts. Yeah. And then we talk this about is the them. show. But the drawback from that is I would love to have had this conversation before I had <laughs> like 200 to 300 people listen to it. No, uh, I think, look, I think it is an excellent pitch and it is partially the nature of this podcast. This is mm-hmm. a first draft podcast. It is also a radio format where we're hitting two hours. Sure. And we, we need do have to, to bring it to an end. We need to bring it to an end and we need to uh, fit everything. And I think you are someone who is so good at the character dynamics that naturally, if you have to squeeze something into 40 pages, you are going to prioritize the character stuff over the and then this happens and this happens and this happens plot beats and but then my feedback is going to be right to find the balance out. more right all right i mean it's the kind of thing where like i it i could go back through and there's still expository dialogue and a lot of that stuff but like okay the conversation between um dr yo and gwen i mean you need it to set up the syringe thing but also i would i it's just it that kind of stuff is just like way too important to me to cut but you're right sure. it's not a matter of having things to get cut it needs a lot more. And that's not surprising given that we're trying to basically outline two-hour movies in yeah. scripts that are hopefully under 60 pages. This one took work to get under 60, yeah, 60 we pages. Can read in, and it's in still of missing a fucking act. So, <laughs> all right. Okay. I really appreciate these notes. I like I like that we are now, we've been doing this for a while now. We're getting more comfortable uh, kind of uh, working as like a workshop team. Yes. Uh, I gave you some notes last time. Mm-hmm. Um, and this time you've given me some notes. And I feel like, honestly, I feel like we had hope. We, I feel like we're hitting a whole new gear on this show in phase two. Dalton. Yeah. And this, you know, these kind of notes, even if we aren't necessarily able to go and and redraft everything from scratch, right, it helps our next pitch. Yes. And so, I mean, basically 
we're going to close in the same place in the story. So when we do our picture lock in a minute, we yeah. are we don't have to like invent a ton of stuff. We just know that if we were ever to go back and say turn these into full scripts, say if we had a Patreon and hit yeah, X number, theoretically, we would maybe try to fill them out into complete scripts and then we produce them to- as uninterrupted audio plays where we don't talk every three minutes. <laughs> um, then we might consider something like that if anything like that were to ever exist. Yes. In the meantime, if we want to go into picture lock because we are yeah. running way late, let's head into picture lock and then we'll talk about what's coming up next on our future episodes. But sure. let's nail in the details because I think this is definitely a good place to lock in. I like where everyone is left. I love that teaser for Dracula Lives. That is perfect. So let's yeah go through what are the important things we need to do to lock in. Gwen and Larry have made up but are not a couple. I like that, and they're they're frisky and horny with each other and they're smooching. Yeah, and I honestly, I think they like each other more now than they ever did. Like, I never really felt like the two of them were all the way in love before. I yeah. felt like there really was this trauma bonding thing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and now I think, I think they really have a respect for a two-way respect they didn't have to. Like, Gwen really, I think, really does love Larry now. I really, I am very impressed by the way you are truly growing and maturing these two characters where it doesn't feel like neither of them are stuck in loops of things they've done before. They truly, everything feels natural and it feels like they are more mature people than they have been previously. And it's it's coming across very, uh, very smoothly. Larry staying in London to join the Brixton Bloodhounds and staying with his uncle Nigel, who now knows the whole story. The Bloodhound gang. That's right. Uh, Gwen has gone back to the States to bring technology to Dr. Halsey that can potentially create a sustainable treatment to control lycanthropy. Mm. John Talbot's dead. And uh, there is a mysterious unnamed vampire played by uh, actor martial artist Joe Taslim. We don't know the character name yet. Don't know the character name yet because I haven't come up with one. And... (laughs) and And he wants to reclaim some important power that presumably he had before Dracula took it from him. Love that. Uh, and that's all I got. Anything Let's I lock it in. Lock it in. Picture lock. It's alive! Oh, in the name of God, now I know what it feels like to be God. So coming up after this, in two weeks, we have another pitch meeting episode with yes. a guest. We're going to be talking to uh, the aforementioned Calvin Kasulke, author of the hit book, Several People Are Typing. And he is, he's is he got quite a pitch for us. He is going to pitch us a competitor film based on The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Yeah, we uh, have a lot of shared DNA there, and it's going to be weird. We were talking about how this is going to be rough because we are building our universe around... Uh, mostly public domain characters. And that means that we can face some very direct competition. Yes, and there is some overlap. We are specifically, I want to say, going to be talking uh, about the 2003 film, which I know is bad, (laughs) but we're not going to do a deep dive on all the comics uh, for this episode uh this is specifically going to be us watching and talking about that movie and pitching an updated version of that film uh we might do a deeper dive in the future Mm -hmm. on 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 some of the alan moore comics but uh we're mostly going to be focusing on the abomination that unless you love it then i love it too um and then after that we will have another dalton pitch then we will give us their creature from the black lagoon i am so excited about my creature take i have so many notes It is the opposite of My Mummy Returns in that it is not a franchise film. It is completely standalone. Sweet. If you want some homework, uh, listeners, before Creature from the Black Lagoon, I would recommend you watch the film Tigers Are Not Afraid by Issa Lopez. Uh, We'll probably talk about it because I'll spoil it right here. I am going to have Issa Lopez direct that movie. And if you want to be able to know the kind of... um, feeling and look i'm going for i think that would be a good some good homework so your homework watch the league of extraordinary gentlemen 2003 <laughs> and tigers are not afraid we're we'll give you one good different. one and one bad one yes I think anytime we do a recommendation <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the show so thank you everybody for joining us on our trip over the pond uh to over london the pond, that famous phrase uh, everyone uh, uses yeah, when they says, travel over, across the atlantic over the pond, over the pond. With Dalton Uh, (laughs) and Dylan. And in the meantime, stay stay afraid afraid of of the the dark dark universe. universe.